Number 10, where's my mummy? Interior of a kitchen, oil on canvas, by Martin Drolling was painted in 1815 and depicts shades of browns, tans, beiges, and golds that were remarkable of the era. Where did he get these colors, some had wondered. Well, good old Martin had a little help from the dead. Mummy Brown was appropriately named as it was made up of, you guessed it, ground up mummies. From the 16th to the 19th century, many painters favored the pigment and it remained available well into the 20th century, even as supplies dwindled. Egyptian mummies are rare nowadays, not because a few survived thousands of years in their tombs, but because few survived the aesthetic and cannibal demands of Europeans. Eating Egyptian mummies reached its peak in Europe by the 16th century. Mummies could be found on apothecary shelves, either in broken shards or ground into powder. So why did these nutcase Europeans believe that there was medicinal value in a mummy? Bitumen. Abundant in the Middle East, where formed in geological basins of the remains of tiny plants and animals, it could be semi-liquid or semi-solid. It is viscous when heated and hardened when dried, making it useful for broken bones and rashes. Supposedly bitumen with wine cured chronic coughs and combined with vinegar, it'll dissolve clotted blood. Other uses included the treatment of cataracts, toothaches, and skin disease. Because of the stickiness, it was called mum or mummia. You see where the mix up is coming in? So when the invasive colonial Europeans saw the black stuff coating these ancient remains for the first time, they assumed it to be that valuable bitumen or mummia they'd heard about. They were quick to start gobbling it down. The mummified remains of Egyptian pharaohs were sold as medicine in Germany well into the 20th century. And Speaking of the dead, how about using them for decor? Ballroom of bones is number nine. Not all bones are tasty enough to eat, and sometimes you got more of them than you can handle. So that's where ossuaries come in. In older times when people perished often before 50, there was obviously a lot more human remains to be disposed of. But sometimes there's not more space. So as a space saving technique, the skeletal remains of buried bodies would be dug up and moved into underground crypts called ossuaries. Many more remains could be stored that way as bones didn't need the whole space Space that a body did and could also be stacked, hung, or broken into position. The Brno ossuary in the Czech Republic is the second biggest in Europe, featuring chandeliers, artwork, words, crosses, really anything that can be made up of bones. These structures and pieces can be incredibly elaborate. Hall State Charnel House features hundreds of hand-painted skulls, and the Sadlik Church ossuary even features a large crown made up of human remains hanging over the pew where they preach from. If you're goth, you may want to consider that for a marriage location. Let's get hot with Greek fire in at number 8. Greek fire, arguably the Jesus of the flame world for its ability to walk on water, baffles historians and scientists alike to this day. Invented in the Byzantine Empire in the 7th century, this fire was used to defend their empire from invaders. Countless documentation verifies to us today that the stories of this fire was very real, but because its formula was a state secret, nobody's quite sure what it was used to create this liquid. The substance could be thrown in pots or shot from tubes. It apparently caught fire spontaneously and could not be extinguished with water. It could burn on top of it. It was heated and pressurized, then delivered via a tube called a siphon at the Grecian enemies. What's truly fascinating about Greek fire is that armies who captured the liquid concoction were unable to recreate it for themselves. They also failed to recreate the machine that it was delivered from. To this day, nobody knows exactly what the ingredients went into this mixture. Dance the day, night, and your life away with number seven in the countdown. The Kavik incident is one of the first few recorded instances of dancing plagues. Later, there are stories of unstoppable, sometimes fatal, dancing in the German town Effret in 1247. Shortly after, 200 people are said to have danced themselves all over a bridge of the Moselle River in Maastricht until it collapsed, drowning them all. The 1518 event was most thoroughly documented and probably the last of several such outbreaks in Europe, which took place largely between the 10th and the 16th centuries. A woman reportedly stepped into the street and began dancing, seemingly unable to stop, and she kept dancing until she collapsed from exhaustion. After resting, she resumed the compulsive frenzied activity. The more she continued, the more others were afflicted, and within a week, 30 others mimicked her strange behavior. Alarmed city officials thought maybe more or better dancing was the solution, so they gathered up the real pros and some music and arranged dancing halls to help the afflicted boogie this out. Instead, the opposite happened, and now as many as 400 people were consumed by the dancing compulsion. A number of them died from their exertions. In early September, the mania began to abate, and that's the 
last we know of this phenomena. So what is this plague? And why were all these people dancing themselves to doom? Well the explanation at the time was the usual stuff like demonic possession or your blood was too hot. Modern day it's likely because of ergot poisoning from molding rye flour used to make their bread as it's been known to cause hysteria and convulsions. To this day hundreds of accounts of dancing plagues are found recorded in dark ages but we have no explanation as to why. I don't see dead people, I see green people. The Woolpit alien children are number 6 in our countdown. Two English chroniclers reported a story from the 12th century that villagers of Woolpit discovered two children, a brother and sister, who had green skin and spoke an unknown language. The children were quickly taken to hire officials, Richard D. Colney's house, where he attempted to communicate and failed. The children also refused to eat for days on end until seeing green beans in the garden, which they ate straight out of the ground. They stayed with Richard long term as he converted them to a normal diet and they started to lose the green pigmentation. Obviously after time and growth these children learned English and when they were asked where they were from they told Richard, we are inhabitants of the land of St. Martin, who is regarded with peculiar veneration in the country which gave us birth. They further explained that where they were from everything was green and they had been tending to their father's animals that they followed into a cave. Emerging out of it they found themselves in Woolpit. The sun does not rise upon our countrymen, our land is little cheered by its beams, we are contented with that twilight which among you precedes the sunrise or follows the sunset. Moreover a certain luminous country is seen not far distant from ours and divided by a very but considerable river. Shortly after this description of a non-existent land, Richard took the children to be baptized in a local church. However the boy died very shortly after from an unknown illness. The girl known as Agnes grew into adulthood and married. She remained private and spoke little to many. And so the secret of their original homeland died with her. Children's Crusade is number 5. Joining where the wild things are and labyrinth for most bratty and annoying kids is a boy in some stories named Stephen, who claimed to have been given a divine message from God to go forth and conquer the world. He was 12. Anyways, Stephen approached many royals looking for resources only to be turned away. He even asked for the support of King Philip of France who very rationally told the kid to go back home before bedtime. This was directly after the Holy Land Crusades, so it was mainly due to the fact that they believed he wanted to live out a hero legacy like his idols because he was 12. Like prepubescent boys, Stephen wasn't going to drop it when told no. He instead started preaching and recruited a band of faithful children to lead them into the Holy Land. One day, having found someone to supply his large gaggle of children, reportedly over a thousand, with a boat, Stephen loaded everyone up unarmed and unprepared and took to the seas. They were never seen again. It's believed Stephen's ship sank or the children were stolen by the ship crew and brought to Egypt for other unfortunate purposes. No matter what happened, the preachings of Stephen led to what's believed somewhat between a thousand and ten thousand children to their demise. Stephen is one of few documented children crusaders, none of which can technically even be labeled as a crusade because to fall under that title a mission had to be delivered and blessed by a pope. No children's crusade was ever approved. Speaking of holy crusaders, the fate of the Templars is number four in our countdown. Founded in 1118 as a monstatic military, their duty was the protection of pilgrims as they traveled to the Holy Land following the Christian capture of Jerusalem during the first crusade. The Knights of Templar quickly became one of the richest and most influential groups of the Middle and Dark Ages, erecting banks, castles, and churches, their wealth would be their downfall. A secret letter detailed black magic and scandalous sexual activities that was sent through France. The reality of this document was that it was made by King Philip of France, who notoriously stole and plundered from anyone he could. In response, more than 600 Templars are arrested, as well as hundreds of non-warriors who handled the day-to-day -day work such as banking, farming, and organizing. The men were charged with a wide array of offenses, including heresy, devil worship, spitting on the cross, homosexuality, fraud, and financial corruption. The Templars, meanwhile, were kept in isolation and fed meager rations, all while facing brutal torture. Given the extreme conditions of medieval methods, it's not a surprise within weeks, hundreds of Templars just confessed to false charges. Their lands and money were confiscated and officially dispersed to another religious order, the Hospitallers, although greedy Philip did get his hands on some of the cash he coveted. Didn't know this guy was real, but the Pied Piper is number three. The proof is etched in the Hamlinia face itself, an inscribed plaque on the stone facade of the so-called Pied Piper's house dating to 1602 reads, AD 1284, on the 26th of June, the day of St. John and St. Paul, 
children born in Hamlin were led out of the town by a piper wearing multicolored clothes. After passing the Calverly near Copenburg, they disappeared forever. The tale, in fact, has survived a very long time. Originating as medieval folklore, it inspired the Grimm Brothers legend, The Children of Hamlin, and one of Robert Browning's best-known poems, The Pied Piper of Hamlin. While there are some small differences in the stories, the basics remain the same. The piper was hired by the people of Hamlin to rid the town of rats. Trailing after their hypnotic notes, the rat catcher and his magical flute made them go to their demise. But when the town refused to pay the piper for his service, the savior came for Hamlin's children. Entranced by the notes of his magic flute, the boys and girls followed the piper out of town and simply vanished. So what happened to Hamlin's children? One theory is that the Pied Piper played the role of a so-called locator or recruiter. They were responsible for organizing migrations to the east, and they were said to worn colorful garments and played an instrument to attract the attention of possible settlers. Popular opinion is, if this is the case, the children may have been taken to the Berlin area, as the family names common in Hamlin at the time show up in surprising frequency in areas of Uckermark and Prisnik, near Berlin. An entry in Hamlin's town records dating 1384 laments that it's a hundred years since our children left. The stained glass window in town, St. Nikolai Church, destroyed in the 17th century, but described in earlier accounts, reportedly illustrated the figure of the Pied Piper leading ghostly white children away. And St. Anthony's fire number two in the countdown is not as cool as it may sound. When people of Paris were tormented with painful boil sore swelling and the sensation of fire in their skin, the only cure seemed to be a trip to St. Mary's Church in Paris. There, Duke Hugh the Great nourished the ill with his holy grain stores, said to help the ill recover. And they did. But as soon as they returned home, they had the plague again with terrible illness. The cause? St. Anthony's fire. The disease starts with faint burning in the skin. Soon red spots covered the infected person's body who felt like their limbs were on fire. Arms would swell and turn bright red, then terrible hallucinations would plague them, convincing them they were being assaulted by demons or dragged to hell. Finally, gangrene would set in and the victim's fingers and toes would drop off one by one. Once infected, few survived. So what caused this horrible disease and why did Holy Grain cure it? Well, if you've seen our video Top 10 Unusual Events from Medieval History, you may know about ergot poisoning. It's a fungus that grows on rye during cold and damp conditions. When the grain is ground up and then made into bread, people consume the fungus and poisoning ensues. So do cues stores of holy grain were better maintained because of his status and they weren't contaminated with ergot. When people ate his grains, their ergotism went away, but as soon as they returned home and they consumed their contaminated grains, they were poisoned again. Ergot would remain undiscovered still for years to come, and many forms of ergot poisoning would manifest in this time. Number one takes the video title seriously though, The Dark Age. It's said the ninth plague of Egypt was complete darkness that lasted for three days. Well, this may not be entirely wrong, with the exception of it actually being eight 18 months. In 536 AD, it said a huge portion of our world went under a dark, mysterious fog that fell on Europe, the Middle East, and parts of Asia. The fog blocked the sun during the day, causing temperatures to drop, crops to fail, and people to die. As a result, countless documents were found in this country of mysterious darkness. However, they weren't taken seriously until the 1990s when researchers in Ireland noticed the rings on the inside of trees indicated some funny business around 536. Summers in Europe and Asia became 35 Fahrenheit to 37 Fahrenheit colder, trying to even reporting summer snow. They realized that the ancient witnesses were really actually onto something. They weren't being hysterical or imagining the end of the world. Now research has also discovered what may be the main source of the darkness. A volcanic eruption in Iceland in early 536 helped spread ash across the northern hemisphere, creating a fog and altering the global climate patterns, causing years of famine. With this realization, accounts of 536 become real horrifying real fast. I mean, put it in perspective. One day the world is plunged into darkness and then the sun just never rises again. In primitive times especially, this seemed to have a traumatic effect. We marvel to see no shadows at our, of our body at new, wrote Cassiodorus, a Roman politician. He also wrote that the sun had a bluish color and the moon had lost its luster and the seasons seemed to become jumbled together. Number 10, carrying a sword. Whatever we see in medieval shows or hear stories or see art, everybody always has a sword at their side. I'll admit, on one hand, literally, it's pretty badass. Was this really that common though in the 12th century? Was everyone gifted a sword on their 16th birthday, like in Zelda Wind Waker? No, 
No, of course not. I mean, if you were traveling, sure, ideally you'd want a little dagger or a little something to help you out, but swords were a symbol of wealth and status. And the bigger and shinier the tune, the better, right? On average, these things would cost you seven months worth of wages. So you best start saving up and training. Yeah, you might want to train as well because these things were not light. No, not at all. Ideally, medieval swords would weigh three to four pounds. Doesn't sound like much at first, but I know after eight minutes, I would be switching arms real quick. It's like when you hold your hand up in class, you're like, oh God, what's going on here? Gotta do some push-ups. In our number nine spot today, we have the death cage. If you were to take a look at the punishments used in history, it quickly becomes clear that people of the past just really liked watching people die or have pain inflicted upon them. It's very strange, it's very dark, and it certainly is not for the faint of heart. The death cage is just one of the many horrifying punishments used during the dark ages. Essentially, this was just one method of execution that was extremely public as they would strip the person down and lock them in an iron cage that was placed placed somewhere that everyone would be able to see. From here, the condemned person would be locked in there with no food or water, and everyone would just watch as they slowly died. Unbelievably messed up for a multitude of reasons, for sure. Sometimes, to make matters even worse, however, the condemned person would also be slathered in milk and honey, so that they would also be attracting insects, just to make the whole dying process even worse. It's all bad. I'm just thankful that those days are over. Number eight, the summer of 13 1848, AKA the Black Death. Now let's talk about this horrible event, shall we? If you thought summer 2020 sucked, well, buckle up, this one was pretty bad too. The bubonic plague traveled, the bubonic plague arrived to medieval England in 1348 and the death toll here was absolutely devastating. Somewhere from one third to half of England's population gone, just like that, and that's it. The plague hit hard and it hit fast. Now today we have variations of the virus, the one we shall not name, but back then the plague was a bacterium now known as Yersinia pestis. Now symptoms were quite jarring. You got lumps in the groin or your armpits, so that can't be comfortable. And next, the infected would notice black spots appearing all over their body. Almost all that were infected died within three days. More often than not, without a fever, so you wouldn't see it coming, aside from the black spots and the things I just said. Now, the drop in the population resulted in a widespread of wealth, workers were demanding higher wages, and farmers were demanding lower rents. The poor got expandable income, so it kinda, kinda helped, kinda didn't, I don't know. I don't know how to explain that. The Black Death spread more than a mile per day, and it's all thanks to traders and travelers. Yeah, humans can't stay still for a bit. We love traveling, even through the Black Death. Cause you know, why not? Roads are empty. As long as there aren't any rats hiding on board, maybe you'll make it. In our number seven spot, today we have the meowing nuns. Mass hysteria wasn't necessarily uncommon in the dark ages. There are a few instances we could discuss, but for today I want to talk about one of my favorites. In the book, The Epidemics of the Middle Ages, which was written by J.F. Hecker in 1844, there was the description of a very strange case of mass hysteria that broke out among nuns in a French convent in the Middle Ages. Basically, one day a nun in this French convent started to meow like a cat. I'm not sure why, I'm not sure how this started, all I know is that it happened. And you know what else happened? Other nuns in the convent began to also meow like cats. Eventually, it became such a that all of the nuns in the convent would meow together for a certain period of time. And of course, everyone surrounding this area was like, what in the absolute heck is going on right now? This is actually a huge problem because in these times, cats were hated. People associated cats with the devil and with disease. So a bunch of meowing nuns was like the equivalent of doomsday. Apparently, the way that this stopped was that the police came and threatened to whip the nuns if the meowing didn't stop, which is definitely one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. Number six, peddlers. Ah yes, that medieval businessman just wandering along in the pine forest in hopes of not getting robbed. A classic image from medieval times. The Dark Ages were a dangerous game, right? So one could only imagine how hard it must have been for a merchant who travels the countryside for a living to sell goods. In Breath of the Wild, you're like, oh thank God, there's that one guy with all the goods that I need. How convenient is this? Awesome. That's not in real life. In the Middle Ages, traveling village to village wasn't an easy task. You couldn't order an Uber and then voila, and unless you were a knight, you probably didn't have a noble steed to take you there. But even so, an outsider showing up to your village to sell goods from a distant land? I don't know, sounds a little sus if you ask me personally. Peddlers were more often than not welcomed with suspicion by locals. Most of the time, peddlers were just accused of being criminals, even if they weren't. Guy shows up, he's like, hey, wanna buy some watches? They're like, you're a robber, you're going away. In our number 
five spot today, we have donations. In the dark ages, it wouldn't necessarily be strange to either donate or sell your own urine. Yeah, the market was hot for urine because they used it a bunch during this time in history. Medieval chamber pots would collect all of the stuff from an entire household or public space wherever they were placed. And oftentimes they could later be sold at the local tanner or fuller in town. I mean, talk about an easy way to make some money, but how horrible. The reason this product was so popular is because it was used in a variety of ways. It could be used to clean clothing, to help with the dyeing process, to tan leather hides, and like I spoke about in a recent video, be used to help in the cotton making process in order to make the material soft and not frayed. While the practical uses make the wholesale process a little less peculiar, it honestly still would just be weird to have to sell your own pee or your neighbor's pee. Number four, color coordinated. I get it, on Wednesdays we wear pink. It's nice to add a little color into your schedule at work in the office. It's fun, sure, have at it. In medieval times, they were serious about their looks and colors. There was no fun around back then. Having rules about what colors and what type of clothing and hats you could wear, you named it. It was all based on your occupation or social level. Some colors were banned for certain professions. Imagine that. For example, imagine if you were a night worker, right? If I can say that, a woman lady of the night. You weren't allowed to wear certain styles or colors. That's hilarious. Hey, welcome to Ontario. We don't wear jeans here. Got it? All right, now get in. 15th century English law banned knights or anybody below knights from wearing velvet, which is so random to me and so funny looking back. Now imagine that. And you may know this one, but purple was a fancy color back then. Purple has been associated with royalty even since the ancient world. Natural purple dye was rare, and medieval Europeans believed that mixing dyes was unnatural and diabolic. It was a no-no. So they were missing out on purple for quite a while because they didn't want to, you know, mixed goods, if I can say that. In our number three spot today, we have divorce by combat. If you talk to most people who are divorced nowadays, they'll tell you about how awful the divorce proceedings can be. It's expensive, it's time consuming, and sometimes things get pretty heated. While these harrowing tales are definitely less than delightful, things could definitely be worse. And by worse, I mean you could be getting a divorce in the dark ages by way of combat. The first documented instance of this was created by Hans Talhofer in a 1467 manuscript. Manuscript. He wrote, quote, As per the instructions, the husband was put up to his waist in a three foot wide hole dug in the ground with one hand tied behind his back. The woman was to be armed with three rocks, each weighing between one and five pounds, and each one wrapped in cloth. Basically, the man couldn't leave the hole, but the woman could run around the edge of the pit. He continued on, quote, If the man touched the edge of the pit with either his hand or arm, he had to surrender one of his clubs to the judges. If the woman hit him with a rock while he was doing so, she forfeited one of her stones. While this sounds like an insane process, it really was true and continued on before growing rare in the early 13th century. Not only has the discovery of this historical practice shed light on something we previously did not know, but it also gives us a glimpse into the gender dynamics of the time period. We're not entirely sure how this sort of divorce ended, but many speculate that this basically continued on until one of them died or one of them surrendered. Number two, bucket family style. For my last one, today we're getting real cozy, real cozy. Remember in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory when all his grandparents have to share that one rickety old bed? Well, that's what everybody at home looked like in the dark ages. Imagine being in the middle, I'm already anxious thinking about it, just stuck. I mean, think about it though, back then space was so limited, warmth is also a plus in those winter nights, and beds, they were massive, they were made of straw and wood. It was a whole thing, it was a whole situation. It's not like you could fit more than one of these in your home, no way, Jose. Even in the royal household, this was a common theme. King King Richard I of England and King Philip II of France both had to sleep in the same bed as an act of diplomacy. Again, I would be so anxious and awkward there. I'd be like, oh, excuse me, Mr. King guy, you're snoring too loud. In our number one spot today, we have affairs of the court. If you know anything about marriage in the Dark Ages, you know that love was often not a part of it. To sort of piggyback off my last point, if you were in a loveless marriage like most everyone else was in the time, but didn't want to go through the process of beating your spouse to a pulp or any of the other divorce methods at the time, you could instead turn to courtly love. This wasn't for the common household and instead was for members of the court, but it allowed the lords and ladies of the time to experience love and courtship despite what their marital status might be. Yeah, 
It was a place for married people to go and hook up. Well, not entirely. I mean, there of course were rules in place and society was very pious, so people weren't exactly hooking up. But it was a huge hit. People danced, they giggled, they flirted, and sometimes people could even be caught holding hands. One of the rules of courtly love just stated, marriage is no real excuse for not loving. At number 10, fashion. Back in the dark ages, fashion and high quality clothing were a symbol of status in society. For the elite, it was their way of displaying their wealth and high status over the poorer population. Because this meant so much to them, obviously they had to go above and beyond with their looks and oh boy oh boy, did they take things to a whole new level. Everything was super exaggerated. For women, they just wore the finest dresses, but for men, that's where things got spicy. Male fashion was quite something. They would often wear dangerously short tunics with tights and belts to really snatch their waist, followed by the codpiece to really accentuate things down under, you know? But their shoes. Don't even get me started on their shoes. They wore some seriously pointy shoes, and to them, the longer and pointier, the better. Their elf looking kicks were really what screamed, I'm better than you, to the rest of the public. Some shoes were so long that they had to be reinforced with whalebone to keep their shape. These people looked pretty ridiculous, at least to our modern standards, but back then, wearing pointy shoes and tunics with the codpiece was like the equivalent to wearing a full Gucci fit. At number 9, helmeted chickens. In the dark ages, peasants didn't really get the best food. The good stuff was more so saved for the members of the elite, and these people ate some good stuff. I mean, to us it's weird, but to them, it was finger licking good. Speaking of finger licking good though, let me tell you about one of their weirdest foods, helmeted chicken. No, it wasn't a special chicken that was prepared with special ingredients or whatever. It was literally what the name is, a helmeted chicken, aka a chicken with a helmet on. I know, weird, right? This was a theatrical dish to say the least. It featured a regular old cooked chicken that was stitched to a pig like he was riding on its back, and to add a special little something something, the cooks would fashion a tiny helmet to make it look like a guard or knight for whatever lord or king that they were serving this bizarre dish to. This was a fan favorite because of how extravagant it was, but that trend sort of lived and died in the dark ages because you can't catch any chef doing something like that these days. Gordon Ramsay would have a fit over this one. Before I carry on telling you guys about all of the weird and crazy things that people did back in the dark ages, I would first like to ask you guys to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and also consider subscribing as well to see more videos like this one. At number 8, beautiful death. Death was kind of a big deal in the dark ages. Sounds weird, but you also have to take into account the fact that the average life expectancy was only about 30 years old, so really, you didn't have long. Also, people back then were faced with some pretty harsh times like famine, cold, and of course, the Black Death. Because they had to face death so early on and so often, the so-called art of dying came to be. The whole premise behind the art of dying revolved around dying a good Christian death. According to those who lived in the Dark Ages, your death had to be planned and peaceful. When someone was on their deathbed, they would concern themselves with accepting their fate without quote, despair, disbelief, impatience, pride, or avarice. End quote. This art of dying thing was very popular amongst priests, and this actually led to a lot of painters at the time depicting people in holy professions as submissive to death and what was to come for them. At number 7, Feast of Fools. One of the more lively aspects of the Dark Ages was the many festivals and holidays that were celebrated. Though most of the population worked grueling hours for days on end, they often got breaks to hold celebrations. Most holidays and celebrations that were held were religious, but others were just silly and were designed for people to have fun, like the Feast of Fools for example. The Feast of Fools was held in early January and was inspired by the pagan festival of Saturnalia. This was a pretty interesting festival because it involved swapping the highest respected officials with serving maids and they became masters and were crowned kings of misrule. This festival first started as something confined to the church, but soon it became a bigger affair with parades, comic performances, music, costumes, and even drag. These people really liked their festivals. Another pretty weird festival that they held was the Festival of the Ass, where a young girl carrying a child would ride on the back of a donkey into a church, and during the service, instead of saying amen, they would say hee-haw like a donkey. I know, bizarre, right? At number six, soccer. These days, people regard soccer or football as a modern European sport, and though it is popular in these modern times, it turns out that the sport has been around a lot longer than you might think. 
Soccer was first played back in the Dark Ages, however, it is very different from the soccer that we know today. Back then, the sport didn't even really have a name and there were no rules either. The only thing that people followed when playing the game was the objective of winning. Back then, you were allowed to win by any means necessary besides deliberately offing people, of course. Back then, soccer became known as a pretty brutal sport. It was violent, chaotic, bloody, and sometimes even deadly. It involved an infinite amount of players, so it was really a free-for-all on the playing field. The sport was so intense that in 1314, King Edward II banned the game decreeing, quote, on pain of imprisonment, such games to be used in the cities in future, end quote. Glad things have changed since then because FIFA would be really intense if it hadn't. And number five, weddings. Marriage and weddings back in the Dark Ages were very different than they are today. Back then, because the average life expectancy was so low, people started getting married and having kids very young. Usually, girls would be married off as soon as they hit puberty, around the age of 12, and these marriages were not for love. Arranged marriages were the norm back then because it was mostly used to join families for status or for alliances. Marriage ceremonies were also very different back then. Because marriages just weren't as big of a deal back then as they are today, it didn't matter where you got married or how soon. Most people didn't need permission to get married, so they could hold the ceremony anywhere. Marriage ceremonies were held in places like pubs, in the middle of the street, or even in bed. Because of this, it made it really hard to know who was really married and to whom until the 12th century when it was declared a holy sacrament that must be observed by God. To make things even weirder, the consummation of marriage was also pretty odd because it wasn't a private affair. The act of bedding wasn't seen as an intimate moment between the couple, but rather an investment in the union, so it was observed by witnesses. I am certainly glad things have changed. At number four, jesters. You would think that being a court jester in the Dark Ages would have been a pretty bleak job, but you would actually be wrong. I mean, yeah, they looked funny with their outfits and hats modeled after the ears of a donkey, but jesters actually held a lot of power in court, making their job a pretty good one compared to other common folk. The court jester's job was to make people laugh by doing tricks, stunts, and telling jokes. Sometimes a jester would poke fun at the king or lord that they served, or would make comments about a kingdom's politics, and for a lot of people, saying these types of things would give them a one-way ticket to the gallows, but not the jester. Because of their profession, by royal decree, anything that they said was taken as a jest or a joke, so no one could get mad or offended at what the jester said or comments on. Basically, the jester was the one person in the court who was immune from medieval cancel culture. They could offend anyone they wanted to, and no one could stop them. At number three, unicorns and Jesus. The thing about the Dark Ages is that it was full of superstition and mythology. Within this period of time, there was a lot of confusion when it came to religion as paganism and the rise of Christianity were both hot topics. Many times, superstitions and mythology from paganism made its way into the religious beliefs of Christians and things were known to get a little weird. Take for example the unicorn and how it was incorporated into the Christian beliefs of the Dark Ages. It is believed that a mistranslation of what is thought to have been an ox is what brought unicorns into Christianity. Because of this mistranslation, the Bible likened Jesus to a unicorn. Since it was in religious texts, people in the Dark Ages sort of just ran with it, and so they started incorporating the unicorn into many religious artworks. To further this whole unicorn thing, they made up a superstition that only innocent maidens were allowed to touch unicorns, and they even used the unicorn to come up with a rather uncomfortable allegory of Christ entering Mary's womb. This unicorn thing was also fueled by the Vikings at one point, Point, as during the medieval age, Vikings were known to con people into buying narwhal tusks marketed as real unicorn horns. At number two, divorce by combat. Back in the Dark Ages, if you wanted a divorce, you had to be willing to fight for it. Literally. In medieval Germany, couples would take to the ring to settle their disputes, and it was quite the showdown. Trial by combat was the common way of settling arguments back then, but when a husband and wife were fighting, things were a little more interesting than just having an all-out brawl. During these divorce by combat proceedings, the husband had to stand in a hole with his hands behind his back, while the wife ran around in a circle with a bag full of rocks. I don't really see how this settled anything, but who am I to question the methods of the Dark Ages? And finally, at number one, Animal Court. 
I think that one of the weirdest things about life in the Middle Ages was their legal cases. As I just told you, their divorce proceedings were literally a trial by combat. They also found bizarre ways of trying someone if they were accused of witchcraft as well, and that was pretty dark, but the strangest court battles involved animals. Yes, animals were sometimes put on trial back in the Dark Ages. All animals from livestock to pets and even insects were not safe from the law and they would be put on trial if they were suspected of breaking the law. According to records from the Dark Ages, at least 85 animals were put on trial for a number of reasons. Pigs were the ones who were put on trial most often for chewing off people's body parts and even eating children. In 1474, a rooster was put on trial and found guilty of the unnatural crime of laying an egg, and even unwanted rats were put on trial and received strongly worded letters demanding that they leave the premises. The most bizarre case though involved a donkey who went through a legal trial and actually won. This donkey became the victim of unwanted advances, but was deemed innocent because someone declared her to be quote, virtuous and well-behaved animal, end quote. These people had way too much time on their hands. Kicking off the list at number 10, Together At Last. Remember when you were a kid and your mom would bump into their friend at the grocery store? That was the worst. While they caught up for what seemed like hours, you were bored out of your mind just staring at like bags of rice and cleaning detergent. That's when the shrew's fiddle comes in. Two women would be locked together, hands included, and face each other, all because they were too loud or they were arguing. These were used in the Middle Ages, most commonly in Germany and Austria, and the contraption would have three holes, one for each wrist and the third for your neck. Now sometimes they would attach a bell to these shrew's fiddles to alert the town that the victim was walking by, you know, in order to talk smack, maybe huck a tomato or two. But the double fiddle, that was the worst. You weren't released until the argument had settled. Some families have an argument shirt where they put the two little siblings in and they can't take the shirt off until they get along. This is like a horrible medieval ages version of that. Much, much more uncomfortable. Not made of cotton. Or funny. Just bad. Just all bad. Number nine, point blank period. All right, babes, let's try not to shudder, but let's talk about periods for a second. Aunt Flo, the Red Sea, Shark Week, so many names to describe a pretty sucky time for people who get their period, right? Well, it might suck these days, but back in the medieval times, it was a hell of a lot worse. They just didn't have the same kinds of resources that we have today, so a lot of people had to use their noodle to figure out how to get by. Period products weren't really a thing back then, so people had to get creative. They would use rags or other linens to fashion a pad, but underwear also wasn't really all that popular yet, so they had to find a way to keep things in place. They would also sometimes fashion a makeshift medieval tampon of sorts where they would wrap cotton fabric around a twig and shove it up their hoo-ha. Sounds mighty uncomfortable if you ask me. Some people would also seek out bog moss because it was remarkably absorbent, so they would make their period products out of that sometimes too. This type of moss garnered the name blood moss because of its use in treating wounds and use in period products. For other people who just couldn't create these kinds of things, they would just resort to wearing red the whole time, so everything just kind of blended in. Menstruation, but make it fashion. Number eight, the ducking stool. This next one requires so much effort as like a team. I can't believe this was a real thing. The ducking stool was made to punish women involved in sexual activities. How dare you? Shame. Men were punished too, but if we know anything about history, it was mostly women who had to put up with this shit. There was first the standard ducking stool, so women would have to sit in this chair, strapped down while sitting outside of their home, or they were carried down the street. Humiliation at its finest. The town would be like, that sucks, can you believe it? Let's take the day off work and embarrass them now. Losers, they're the losers. So stupid, so backwards. The second version of the ducking stool was essentially the same thing, only it was ducked into a river over and over and over again to cool her moderate heat. At least that's what French writer Francois Maximilien Misson says. They should cool off all those angry villagers, if anything. I don't know, dip them in the river. They're the ones burning with rage because somebody who lives over there had sex once. It's really weird, go home, relax. At number seven, Satan's incarnate. Back in the medieval age, women were very much oppressed and incredibly misunderstood. I mean, they thought so many women were witches, and as time went on, the criteria for diagnosing a woman with witchitis or whatever got bigger and bigger to the point where literally any woman could be accused of being a witch for the most BS reasons. Back then, people thought that women were Satan's incarnate, and so they were predisposed to sin, and therefore, they had to be witches. Logic? 
Not quite present, but go off I guess. There were four reasons why a woman could be considered part of the devil's posse. One, because it was believed that women are foolish and gullible, which is why they turn to magic. Two, because women are insatiable when it comes to their carnal pleasures, and so they seek out help from the devil to satiate their needs. Three, because women talk a lot and we speak lies, apparently. And four, because women are weak, and the only way we can seek revenge is by using magic powers and spells. Now what in the balls is this all about? I don't know. Maybe men in medieval times were just jealous that they couldn't kiki it up with the devil, or because they knew deep down that women run the world. Number six, nosy neighbor. If you were a man back in the middle ages and you had an affair, well, you would have to pay a fine. And then that's it. You would go back to your life. But if you're a woman, like everything else on this insane list, it was so, so much worse. Affairs happen a lot, okay? It's normal. Remember that Ashley Madison scandal back in 2015? It sucks, but also it's not surprising at all. This isn't news to us. Back in the Middle Ages, women were treated the worst for these affairs. They would take their noses off. They would literally take a woman's nose and or ears off of their face because they had an affair. Frederick II used to punish adulterers by using renotomy. That was the removal of one's knows. The whole point of this was to make the victim unattractive. Isn't that the worst thing you've ever heard? This is a real thing people did, swear to God. Thing is, nobody is running around confessing that they're cheaters. Somebody has clearly spilled the beans, so they knew what was going to happen if they got caught, yet they would still rat each other out. Meanwhile, the guy just pays a small fee. Snitches get stitches. Just saying. At number five, married young. Lots of people get married at different ages. I mean, I know people I went to high school with who are already married, and I know people who didn't get married until later in life. But in medieval times, women, or rather girls, were getting married off at very young ages. At just 12 years old, a girl would reach the age of maturity and was then entitled to marry, usually to someone her parents had already chosen for her. To me, that just sounds so unfair, right? I mean, this kid hasn't really been able to live their life, make mistakes, and learn from them, and now they're expected to be a wife and soon a mother? I could never. I mean, I'm only 22, so I'm not even thinking about those prospects, but I couldn't even imagine the amount of pressure that would be on a 12 year old at the time. What's worse than just the age at which these girls got married was the treatment that they received from their husbands. Under civil law, a husband was literally allowed to physically harm his wife. In moderation, of course. It was actually a medieval tradition for husbands to quote, treat his wife as a pupil and teach her manners. As you could imagine, this made a lot of wives really mad, and so many wives offed their husbands. But things rarely got better after that because if they were caught, they would be sentenced to burn at the stake. Note to self, don't get married in medieval times. Number four, the walk of shame. We've all heard the term walk of shame at some point, but what does it really mean? And also, where did it originally come from? Well, it was originally referred to as a skimmington or rough music. I know, it doesn't mean they would blast Slipknot this whole time. This was done to wives who were bossy or overbearing. They would be forced to walk through the entire town barefoot, all those crooked, horrible stone roads, ankles just toast, it was horrible. They would also be scandally clad too because why not? Because men are making the rules, that's why. And as you guessed it, crowds would be waiting outside, all prepared to bang pans and yell horrible things at her. I guess these dudes just never had jobs. I don't know, they were just always on standby, ready to yell at a lady walking by through town, bare feet, all because she was deemed too bossy. Okay. If you're wondering who exactly is responsible for these public humiliations, um, the court. The official court. Judge Judy back in the day would be like, yes or no, did you raise your voice? Okay, case dismissed. Take your shoes off, we're done here. What a joke. At number three, ladies of the night. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do to get that coin, right? We all have our side hustles and dead end jobs to be able to afford rent and whatnot. And sometimes we're not exactly proud of the work that we do to make money. It was the same back in medieval times. People had to find any means to make money and for a lot of women, they used what their mama gave them to support themselves and their families. One of the more positive sides of life for women in medieval times was the fact that being a woman of the night was actually a recognized profession. Later on throughout the times, this profession would be deemed illegal, but in medieval times, it was as common as being a baker or something. These women were actually considered to be merchants because they sold their bodies as if it was any other sellable good. Being a woman of the night was such a common and widespread profession that nearly every town in medieval times had a brothel, even in towns with small populations. So yeah, maybe they didn't have that big of a marketplace, but they no doubt had a place where you could 
should go see some quality mommy milkers. Number two, Grand Theft Witchcraft. If you were a woman in the Middle Ages, you were accused of being a witch pretty often. They thought women communicated with the devil, like Brie mentioned earlier, just because some townsfolk with three teeth said so. Great, thanks Abe. Good job, good report. The punishment for practicing witchcraft wasn't a heavy fine, like guys who cheated, but they would be burnt at the stake. This was popular in Scotland along with drowning. Those are the two big ones. Remember earlier how I said women would sometimes be dipped into a river or a pond? Well, they would also sometimes just be left there. It's called witch dipping, and depending on if she floated or sank, that's, you know, Witch or not, the dumbest thing I ever heard. If you were charged with treason or witchcraft, that was the ideal punishment, because it surely beats burning to death in front of an entire village. This all got out of control come the start of the 17th century with the Salem witch trials. That's when people were like, you know what, I think this is wrong. I think we should stop, let's put this torch out. I think we're good. That's when 19 people were executed for being witches. God forbid you knew how to do bed mass in the Middle Ages. Also, that's a lot of coordination to get that many townsfolk together and be like, okay, you need this, you need this. How many people are standing here? Almost like you would use basic math to figure that out. You're a witch too. Spoiler alert, we're all witches because we know things. I don't know, I hate this. And finally at number one, crimes of the heart. For some unknown reason, people were really out here in these streets in medieval times trying to accuse women of everything. Witchcraft was a common accusation, but the other common crime that women were often accused of was adultery. But you see, the thing is, Someone could accuse a woman of adultery even if she never had physical contact with another person. Now, how the heck does that work, you ask? Well, it depended on where these people lived. During the medieval age in the Byzantine Empire, it was considered adultery if they spent a night outside of their husbands' or parents' homes. In Slavic parts of Europe, a woman could be considered guilty of infidelity for simply going to a public event. I'm pretty sure with this logic, if you even breathe in the same general vicinity of a man, then you could be accused of adultery. I mean, what the F is that up? The only bright side, I guess, is the fact that when it came down to punishments for adultery, men usually got the worst punishments in comparison to women. However, they would be accused of this crime way less often than women, so I guess in a way we still got the short end of the stick. Damn it. Kicking off the list at number 10, an arming squire. Being a knight, okay, obviously this sounds cool on paper. They have the sword, they have the horse, the flowing lady, the gal on the back of said horse. They're saving the damsel in distress or something, right? Sometimes they lose a hand like Jamie Lannister, but that's just what being a knight is all about, right? Also, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen Game of Thrones nine years ago. It wasn't always a fairy tale epic being a knight. First of all, this process starts when you're seven years old as well. So you would be given to a noble to learn for seven years, and then at age 14, you became a squire. Ah, yes, a noble squire. We've heard this term before. What do they do? Uh, well, it's, it's a knight's intern. Yeah, not an ideal job to have when you're young, but it's a job nonetheless. Also, you had no choice, so you, you had to do it. Welcome to the Middle Ages. Arming squires, they had a lot of responsibility. Arming squires would repair a knight's armor while they were still wearing it. Yeah, how fun is that? Oh, which buckle was it? Ah, uh, yes, that one. Mm. Yeah, fixing up chainmail on a grown man's thigh. Not ideal, welcome to the Dark Ages, pretty dark. Also, after these epic messy battles, arming squires would have to clean everything off of their armor. Yeah, everything. A lot of yuck going on in that business day. This was long before Dawn soap was also a thing, so they had to clean with urine. Yeah, gross, so gross, it gets worse and worse. Welcome to the Dark Ages. Number nine, Plague Bearer. Yep, this one's as awful as it sounds. The title of this one really gives it away. Ah, the hot summer of July 1665. What to do with all of these poor souls who have been hit by the plague in the Dark Ages? Where do we put them? What do we do? You can't just hide them all in the catacombs this time around. So now what? Well, a plague bearer, he's got your back. Church wardens would organize burials, right? This was a normal thing even back in the Dark Ages in the 1600s, but when the plague hit, they had to change things up a little bit. If somebody had the plague, these guys would be responsible for transporting them far, far away and then burying them. A church would house these plague souls away from society. How grim is that? But it's probably a great call, all things considered. Poor guy. Number eight, a knight. When we think of the knights in you know, the dark ages and stuff, we often forget about the silly royal duties that one had to attend to. Yeah, you thought jury duty sucked. Oh boy. Beastly justice. You ever heard of this? If not, buckle in. Beastly justice was when animals had to go to court. Yeah, they were put on trial as well, as well as humans. It's wild to look back at a knight and all the things they had to do for their kings and queens, but the fact they also had to wake up early, 
and attend court like a noble, like royal court where a wild animal was now taking the stand. Like what a joke. I'd be like, really? Do I have to be here? I woke up at 4.30, what's going on? Yeah, this would happen after an animal runs through town. It would attack people, you know, being confused and being an animal and all. But the townsfolk would actually believe that the devil was somehow involved in this whole ordeal. Like these animals worked for Big Red himself, right? How weird is that? In 1457, villagers in France had to deal with six pigs who ran wild and attacked locals. They did a lot of damage apparently. But instead of just, you know, setting the animals free or putting them down or whatever, they just took them to court. A real court, like a real trial. There was a judge, a couple prosecutors, eight witnesses, a defense attorney for the pigs, which I gotta say that we gotta do a list on that. That's a terrible job. That's one of the worst jobs ever, I, I lightly introduced here. These pigs were then hung from a gallows tree. It was so horrible. The dark ages, dark, right? A knight had to formally hang pigs after a trial was concluded. Yeah, being a knight sucked. Number seven, leech collector. I always enjoyed catching frogs growing up. That was always fun, but apparently I, I gotta step my game up. <laughs> This is weak. A leech collector is, well, exactly what you think. Back when medicine was pretty much non-existent, sickness was just wafting throughout these old towns, just eh, moving through towns. Like the G from the Goosebumps logo, just haunting towns, moving through. Scariest intro ever, eh? So the solution back in the day was the classic, oh, if you feel sick, maybe try bleeding for a bit. Mm, see if that helps. Yeah, they would use horses' legs to lure out these leeches, but most of the time, these leech collectors would have to get in and get dirty and just grab them themselves. They would have to swim around and touch as many things as possible. They would make contact with as many leeches as possible. How gross is that? That was the best way to collect them, really. I would have fainted so often, that is horrible. The loss of blood here was obviously so intense, so it was a you know horrible job to have. And on top of that, you gotta look out for the same reason they need leeches in the first place. Disease, yeah, that's still out there. Leech collectors were so common throughout the 18th century that leeches basically were extinct at that point. We almost lost leeches, oh, so close. Number six, jesters. The earliest accounts of the fool go back to the 11th century, so pretty OG. These fools were hired to liven up the party, you know, dance and be silly, wear pajamas. Most of you have an image of a jester in your head, you know, jumping around on tables, telling jokes. That's actually pretty accurate. Yeah, it was pretty fun. It was one of the best jobs to have, obviously. This title of a minstrel or a fool, rather, it was an honor to have. The fool's payment also was, was no funny business. That was good stuff. Roland Le Petier, he was like a major jester back in the day. This guy got 30 acres of land from King Henry II. Just here, here you go. Just show up and fart and be funny. Have all this land. That's like a kingdom. You have a kingdom because you're funny and you're silly. He would whistle, jump around, and literally fart on people. On Christmas Day, this guy would come over and just ruin your entire breakfast and just be like, yeah, I have all this land. And then he would take off. It's crazy, you just ruined Christmas, sir. Stop farting on my food and family, thank you. I would never want to be a jester. They had to also like go into battle and like spread bad news too. It was fun and silly, but they were also royal. They had to do lousy stuff too. Number five, groom of the stool. Nowadays, higher ups in the office, they have assistants, you know, to grab your coffee for you. Maybe they answer some phone calls, keep the business running while you're off, you know, doing your businessman stuff. Assistants are vital today. The groom of the stool though, that was, uh, huh, that was a bit much. We have some labor laws put in place now. I don't think we're gonna see any online ads opening for a groom of the stool. We'll see though, fingers crossed, I had good benefits. Back in the dark ages, this role was vital and respected. It was created by King Henry VIII and this role was to assist the king and specifically assist his bowel movements. You had a box that you carried with you at all times. That's where the, that's where the magic happened. The dark magic happened in this box. You would literally follow the king around until he needed to go to the washroom, until he needed said box. Porta potties weren't a thing back then and there's no way you're going to catch that king squatting in the woods. In fact, you wouldn't even catch that king wiping his own behind. That chore was also reserved for the groom Oh, the stool. Yeah, lucky you, right? In this stool, you would have water, towels, a wash bowl. The whole setup would be in there. You're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this role? A prisoner? Somebody who lost their sense of smell, hopefully? No, only sons of noblemen could take on this role. And in doing so, they also gain access to every room in the castle, tons of clothes, any bedchamber furnishings, you name it. And of course, a high pay. Always helps, thank God. That's maybe the worst job in history, maybe. We're almost there, you'll see. Number four, divorce lawyers. 
If you've seen Game of Thrones, you've heard of trial by combat. That was the that was the norm back in the day. You know, you fight for your freedom. That's great. But what about divorce by combat? What in the Mr. and Mrs. Smith is happening? Was this real? I can't believe this. If you and your significant other weren't getting along in the dark ages, instead of, you know, dishing out thousands on couples therapy and signing all that paperwork and getting it done with and going your separate ways, no, instead they would battle each other. Like combat. It was an organized event too. It had restrictions in place for the husband. It's pretty hilarious to think back on. Like the husband would have to stand in a hole with one hand tied behind his back while the wife ran circles around this hole with a sack full of rocks. A sack full of rocks, how intense is that? That's why you don't cheat in the dark ages, Lancelot, okay? Just take the barn, take the horse, take it all, I quit. Get me out of this hole, untie me. Number three, Toshers. Toss a coin to your tosher, here we go. This was one of the worst jobs back in the day and it wasn't even a legal job. Shh, don't tell. If you don't need, uh, if you don't need toshers, Keep, keep their secret, you know? Early 19th century London, I know, a little more modern here, but definitely worth a mention. These toshers would spend all their time in sewers below London trying to find coins or valuables that have been just accidentally washed away. Yeah, they would just search for scrap metals, anything really that nobody else wants to go down and claim, or reclaim rather. It was worth the plunge as well. A lot of these folks would make around 20,000 a year. Just gotta do this a lot, and you're good. Number two, dentist, doctor, surgeon, spy. Dentists were not a thing in the Middle Ages, you know. Dr. Downer didn't politely tell you to floss more and then shake your hands while you're watching a show, getting a cleaning. No, it wasn't like that at all. They did have a barber. They had one guy, he did it all. A barber from the Dark Ages. Yeah, this appointment is gonna suck, my friends. Cavity, toothache, maybe you accidentally bit a rock, chipped a molar. They would only pull these teeth. That was the only solution. Barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, bloodletting, you know, the classic three-in-one appointment we all have to do every month. Doctors were seen throughout history and they've seen a lot of horrible stuff. Back in the 1500s, patients were walking in with an arrow sticking out of their legs. Yeah, instead of cutting the tip off and pulling the opposite way, the arrow removed would come in and then, you know, cut into the injury, opening it more. That's always great. And then you would hold it open and then you'd pull the entire arrow back out of your leg. Yeah, what a fun job. Or chest. Wherever the arrow went, you had to figure that out. It's poor soul. And finally, number one, the rat catcher. Another Game of Thrones classic. If you're a rat person, I know there's a lot of people who do like rats, like rat tricks and they have like cool rat friends. That's awesome. I'm not one of those people. I'm not bashing you, but I am bashing this job. This would suck. First of all, rats as a medieval punishment was horrible. Where do I even begin with this one? This was one of the worst punishments for the rats as well. This is a two for one when it comes to pain. A rat trap involved a man being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure would be strapped to his abdomen or chest. And then inside this enclosure, they were rats and they were also like tucked away. And then historically, they would heat the uh, metal enclosure and the rats would panic and try and get out and they would chew through the softest part, which in this case was your chest or abdomen. It was horrible, it was an absolute nightmare. But these rats had to come from somewhere, or rather someone. As the name hints towards, rat catchers are one of the worst jobs you can have in, or rather out of a castle. It's an important role, you know, just like being a fool or a literal walking, talking toilet. There needs to be a chasseur de rats. Back in those times, rats and mice were the leading source of spreading disease, and with these castles being big and dark, there were probably a lot of them hiding. Black rats were a common household problem, so we need to get those out. So in comes the well-respected rat catcher. These guys would sometimes try new spells to get rid of the rats. Wasn't always helpful, wouldn't work. More often than not, didn't work. So poison powders were the next main trick here. Also the Pied Piper, he was an OG, historically. He would do a musical number to exterminate your pets. If anything, he should be getting a bonus. Any rat catcher, actually, today or back in the dark ages, you deserve a bonus, my friend. You're a brave soul. Rome really had existed as nothing but a name by the time the empire falls on September 4th of 476, having been falling inwards on itself for just short of a century at that point. So started the periods between the 5th and the 15th centuries, known as the Middle Ages. This time can be split into three main sections, the Early Middle Ages, AK the Dark Ages, High Middle Ages, and Late Middle Ages. One of the most famous events from the entirety of the Middle Era was truly kicking some ass in the Dark Ages, and it was the Black Death. Something that nobody gets anymore, with exception for a cool 20,000 some odd people between 2000 and 2009, and 56 people in the United States in the last few years. But if we pretend that we don't know that, and if we can avoid chipmunks like the effing plague carrying hairbringers of death they are, then we most likely don't have to worry. But travel back in time, say, to the 800s or even 1340s Europe, and your chances of surviving are somewhere between 7 and 10 and 2 and 5. Black Death killed as much as 
60% of the entire population of Europe. So when you're at work looking around but with those blank dead fish eyes bored, cross off every third person you see in a pattern of five and try to figure out how many of them are gone and who you'd manage without. Probably now being in a position to go, hey boss, looks like you need new middle management team and ain't since nobody left, hooray, promotion. That's exactly what happened in the Middle Ages too, after half the world died, kind of changed the balance of power. Suddenly peasants could ask for pay raises and improvements in working conditions and life got a little better for them. This was further developed by the evolution of feudalism. And as a result, the first banks and widespread money supply appeared for the first time in Europe. RIP freedom, hello capitalism. And speaking of the workforce, how about their dirty jobs? Knight, tosher, rat catcher, oh my, there's no shortage of terrible jobs in the dark ages. So let's cover a few. So a leech collector was a woman's role. She was often living in the countryside near marshes and bogs, just generally dirty open water spots where she could strip her legs bare, grab a bucket and wade into the mud, waiting for leeches to sucker themselves on. At that point she could scrape the buggers off, bucket them and then sell them in town to physicians, the wealthy people, beauty stores, whatever. Enjoy the scabs and infectious diseases. The groom of the stool was a position for the royal household who was in charge of cleaning the king's badunkadunk, making sure it was clean and dry post his kingly, well, dumps. Tanning leather seems like it would just be hard. Don't worry, on top of stripping animal skin of its fur, soaking it and consequently yourself in lots of lime and salt, it also involved animal feces. See, you'd hire this other guy who somehow had a worse job than you, he's called a pure collector. He'd collect you dog poop, you'd grab it with your bare hands and mush it into leather to treat it. And don't get started on lime burners or treadmill operators, which was essentially a 50-50 death sentence job. And usually whatever job you ended up with was one for life, because chances are you stay in one place. Many people dream of traveling, my generation especially is one that's opting out of children in order to do so. This isn't new, and the human desire to travel and learn is something inherent, coming with curiosity and the need to discover. But this wasn't one of those times. Written records show that a sizable proportion of people not only didn't travel to other countries, they never even left their region or the village they were born in. Even if you did manage to travel, it wasn't planes and annoying but passable airport waits. The average traveler would often sleep out in the open air. Inns or other forms of accommodation were few and far between, and usually too expensive for the typical person to afford. So aside from the super fun chance of freezing to death overnight, travelers in the Middle Ages also had to worry about being robbed or attacked on the road. Many people therefore chose to travel in groups, but even then you weren't entirely safe. Your homies could turn on you at any second. Consider also that roads and pathways were rough, and this was a ridiculous era where even spraining an ankle could prove to be fatal. Then there's finally bridges, which are quite rare, especially outside of big cities. So you might have to cross rivers manually, and while they could memorize and recite Latin every day, these dummies couldn't swim. Drowning was all too commonplace, even the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick I died while attempting to cross a river. So if you're gonna live in one region, one city, and one house your whole life, naturally it would be a dingy shack. Because peasants homes were small, often just made up of one room. They were constructed of wattle and daub, a type of method of constructing walls in which vertical wooden stakes or wattles are woven with horizontal twigs and branches and then daubed with clay or mud. Then they'd have a thatched roof to boot. And if they're well constructed, these bad boys could be waterproof and stand for a decent amount of time. But they required upkeep and not everyone can afford that, especially seeing as it's essentially paper mache twigs and mud, you really had to stay on top of this. Inside of a hut, a third of the air Area was penned off for animals which lived inside with the family. I know people that complain about the smell of a cat litter box. My guy, you could have had a whole donkey living next to the kitchen sink. Chickens, cows, pigs. Then to really complement the mildew smell of rotting roof and the stink of sweat and feces covered animals, a fire burned in the hearth in the center of the hut so that the air was permanently eye watery smoky. Furniture was maybe a couple stools, a trunk and bedding, and a few cooking pots. Beds were a thing, but they weren't very great. And don't forget a couple of dirty chamber pots kicking around the room. We may have discovered a new homing style, you guys. We could call it medieval open conceptualism with minimalism aesthetic. And when it's time to get your kid out of the house, you hook them up with an apprenticeship. The freaky Greekies weren't the only ones tossing their kids at other adults saying, here, take this and raise it. However, unlike the Greek apprenticeship, which came with some strings attached, as explained in the recent top 10 reasons why living in ancient Greece was impossible video, the dark age apprenticeship was truly and solely about work. But nobody said it was 
good or fair work. From the midpoint of the Middle Ages onward, master craftsmen were permitted to employ youngsters for free so long as they provided them with food, lodging, and formal training in their specific craft, which would undoubtedly elevate their status in this society. But getting through an apprenticeship was hard as hell. First, nobody said the food had to be quality, so rations often sucked and apprentices could effectively starve. But then there was the fact you could just get beat up by your master at any time, because it was literally expected of them to do that. Why? Because apprenticeships were ways of parents to get crappy, troublesome teens out of the house and learn some discipline in society. To add insult to injury, apprentices were stuck between childhood and adulthood by being teens. Because on one hand, a teen in medieval times would have been treated as an adult. On the other hand, privileges of adulthood, like the right to inherit money or ownership of land, didn't come into play until around age 21. So you're expected to be an adult, treated like a kid. Small wonder then that the tales of apprentices misbehaving badly are a staple of written accounts from the Middle Ages. Rather than dedicating themselves to their professional development, apprentices would often be found in pubs and brothels. Normal middle aged teen activity. And having a crappy kid sucks even more so back then than now because of the baby gamble. Choosing, if a woman got to choose, to have a baby was a hell of a decision in the dark ages. Plagues, famines, messed up weather, just not the environment for it. Let alone women being regarded as morally weak and they weren't allowed to do things that modern women take for granted, like getting a job, deciding who to marry, having opinions, wearing pants. Your only two options were to become a nun or marriage. No work, no single living in the country, you get two options. And even if you weren't the most devoutedly religious, none was safer, if not a better option. Childbirth and pregnancies would kill one out of every three women in the dark ages. Compare that today's maternity morality rate as one out of every 0.02 8% of women, the fact that the female population now is significantly more equal in numbers to men in comparison, I think the choice is spectacularly easy. According to the Raven Report, childbirth in the Middle Ages and the Tudor period were so dangerous, royal women were encouraged to write out their last will and testament well in advance to giving birth. Just imagine adding that to the baby to-do list under decorate nursery and sew onesies. But on the flip side, some men weren't exactly capable of popping out babies, thus the impotence trials. Modern time has counseling, understanding doctors and little blue pills. All sorts of resources to help men with that issue. But the Middle Ages? Whew, don't expect any real sympathy. Not from wives or the whole community. Conjugal duties are taken hella seriously. Partially because everyone was frisky and they're locked into having just one person for the rest of their life. And it wasn't just men who had the right to ask their partners to perform. Wives could also demand intimacy and failure to provide? Well, buddy, you're getting served. And many recorded cases of women being granted divorce due to their husband's infancy exist to prove it. And they were carried out in public. Whole Judge Judy style throwdowns to called impasse trials where accused man was expected to um, perform in front of the jury. To be granted a divorce, the woman had to prove her man was unable to perform, which wouldn't be shocking when you have an entire village watching with bated breath, even if it wasn't an issue before. Don't worry, a dude could save himself the shame of an annulment by calling on special witnesses such as working girls or other women from the past who could attest his manly prowess. Any medieval lady capable of putting her husband through such a humiliating ritual was almost always from a wealthy family. Lawyers and expert physicians didn't come cheap, but at the end of the day, men were literally able to cut our faces off in public or throw us in a fire alive for not baking bread rice. So guys, I don't really think you can complain about this too much. Laws like this are one of the many stupid details that could have you randomly imprisoned. Another one, stingy stripes. Living in the dark ages is impossible for a lot of reasons, but having to keep track of hundreds of stingy laws to ensure you don't get locked up over a mistake truly was one of the hardest factors. What was the wrong way to pray? The wrong hair, a mole in the wrong spot, a color only the king can wear, or how the simple act of wearing stripes could lead to your imprisonment or even death. Why? Because for some reason, striped clothing were seen as a garment of the devil. Thus, anyone caught wearing them would at best get an evil eye from people in the street or at worst, get a hemp necktie. From the year 1250 onwards, the only people who were caught wearing stripes were the lowest of the low in society. Working girls, handicapped, the ill, the orphaned, they would don striped outfits highlighting their status as outsiders. In 1295, Pope Boniface issued a papal decree banning religious orders from wearing any type of striped clothing. In the year 1310, in the French town of Rouen, for example, a local cobbler was condemned to death simply because he'd been caught wearing striped clothes. Crazily, even animals weren't exempt. Records show that zebras were called beasts of the devil, even though people in Europe had only ever heard reports of them and hadn't even seen one with their own eyes. You can see how these guys led to colonization, right? Ridiculous. With the dawn of the Enlightenment in Europe, the hatred of stripes eased and eventually disappeared, and many look on the phenomenon with confusion, and understandably so. Time for the Shrek references. It's 
ogres and pitchforks. More specifically, just the pitchforks and less specifically, really just the farm tools in general. You guys know in the movies like Shrek when the villagers all come carrying pitchforks and farm tools and of all things, like why that and not swords? First of all, swords are heavy and who has that kicking around? Seriously. Secondly, noblemen could require all male peasants over the age of 18 to report for military service. Didn't matter if it was a justified war against a viable external threat or just a petty fight against a local rival. If you are called up for duty, you had to report. According to histories of the time, around one in five peasant men would be in a military service. Food and clean water were in short supply and disease was rife. Some historians reckon two thirds of all conscripted men who died were killed by unsanitary conditions of their own camps over any enemy action. But peasants were required to bring their own weapons. Moreover, they would rarely receive anything more than rudimentary training, so they're sent to war unprepared and ill-equipped. Thus the thought process, well, this tool works on my farm. For this, it'll work for that. So uh, what really sucked about military service in medieval times is how little was in for it for you. These days joining the military can be a way of learning a trade or generally improving your lot in life. Not so back then. Feudal lords were fearful of their peasants getting too powerful. So you're once a farmer, you're staying one. If a peasant soldier got too skillful on the field of battle, there were several cases of them ending up mysteriously dead. It's like getting a journalist of the year award from the CIA. And finally, it wasn't just living that was impossible, but death sucked too. All right, so evidently, whether from this video, others, or general universal knowledge, Dark Ages was pretty grim reality to live in. It's short, dirty, desolate, and brutal. But when it wasn't short, it was somehow worse. See, anyone over the age of 50, which was a crazy age achievement at the time, was deemed elderly. Unlike other cultures existing at the time, elderly in Europe are not even close to revered or respected. You didn't get to retire, having to pay your own way and continuing to work until physically you simply couldn't. Then, yeah, after that, you're really just a burden. Your own kids are side-eyeing you and everyone's asking you why haven't you haven't died yet. What's the big hold up here, guys? For many, death was the only real chance to escape from everyday hardships or working the fields and trying to get enough money and food to survive. And when that finally happens and you pass through and rejoin the energies of our earth, you will finally find your peace. Yeah, no, psych, that still didn't happen. According to some research in Europe during the Middle Ages, massive 40% of graves were disturbed. Now, this wasn't like grave robbing during the Enlightenment. There were no university medical schools paying good money for fresh corpses to study. Rather, most cases of grave disturbances were run-of-the-mill theft. Often people would be buried with a small selection of their possessions, perhaps a favorite cup, a locket, a stuffed animal toy, or other such trinkets. In tough times, even some dead person's mystery grave junk might be enough to tempt a broke thief to dig someone up. However, this wasn't always the case. There's some even weirder crap, too. Archaeologists in England have found evidence to suggest that in dozens upon dozens of quote grave robbing cases, rather than looking for objects, those responsible bound and gagged the dead bodies and then left them like that. It seems like they're fearful of restless souls or perhaps of the undead rising again. Who knows, they had a lot of problems back then. Number 10, beauty sleep. When you go to bed at night, ideally you want eight hours. Me, personally, I'm lucky if I get like six. I don't know, I'm like a child. I'm restless at night. I'm kicking around, I'm making weird noises. It's insane, it's problematic. Maybe I should see someone. If this were medieval times, however, I'd be set. See, back in the dark ages, it was common to have two four hour naps at night rather than one swift eight hour slumber. See, many believe this was to tend to a fire or hopefully not a fire. You know, gotta wake up, make sure things aren't gone. It's medieval times, it was rough. You wake up, throw a log on, yawn, and then hop back into your pile of hay. I don't know, whatever they had back then. Good times. This system of waking up after four hours, it sounds like an unhealthy inconvenience, but in reality, historical accounts suggest that people in the dark ages generally slept for longer periods of time, despite their sleep being interrupted by periods of wakefulness. They slept longer due to the fact that, you know, light bulbs didn't exist yet, so lava lamps weren't a thing, neither were alarm clocks. So people would often go to bed shortly after sunset and wake up with the sunrise, so that's a good rest. That's a good medieval rest. That's like 12 hours. Number nine, the Norse disappearance. I just watched the Norseman. I'm gonna start barking at people now when I'm on the subway, just to, you know, get my old roots back, my old Norse roots. There are several theories regarding the disappearance of the Norse from Greenland during the Dark Ages, right? Where did they go? Where does a Norse Viking go? That's a little concerning. Where'd that guy go with the beard and the hatchet? That's a little important. One theory suggests that climate change played a significant role. The Little Ice Age, which began around the 14th century, that led to a decrease in temperature and a shorter growing season. Of course, making it difficult for the Norse to farm and raise livestock. And, you know, 
have that big mighty beard and eat good. This could have resulted in a decline in food production leading to famine and ultimately the collapse of Norse settlement. Another theory suggests that the North were on the North, the Norse, the North of the North. Another theory suggests that the Norse were unable to adapt to the harsh conditions of Greenland. The Norse were used to living in more temperate climates and the extreme conditions of Greenland could have been too difficult for them to endure. They're a little too hot for comfort. Finally, there's a theory that the Norse were driven out by the Inuit who had been migrating into Greenland around the same time as the North. So a little bit of a beef happened there, a little West Side story with Vikings, if I may. The Inuit were skilled hunters and fishers, and their presence could have put pressure on the North Settlement, ergo war. But it's likely that the combination of these factors contributed to the disappearance of the North altogether, so exact reason, that's uh, still a mystery. I vote the Inuit though. There's probably some beef. There's probably some settlement beef. Number eight, green children of Woolpit. Now this one, this is a medieval story that tells the tale of two children who randomly appeared in the village of Woolpit in England, but they showed up with green skin and they spoke an unknown language. So aliens confirmed, for sure aliens. I wouldn't even open that door. The children were taken in by a nice local landowner. And although they were initially very distressed and refused to eat any human foods, they eventually adapted to their new surroundings. Again, green children didn't speak English, aliens. Reminder. The boy eventually learned to speak English over time and he explained that he and his sister came from a land where the sun does not shine and everything was green. Yeah, it's like Avatar 3 going on. Something's going on out there. Sometimes the grass is greener on the other side, but sometimes the people are also green. That's fun. That's a fun little bit. Bunch of incredible hooks in a place where there's no sun. Sounds nice and warm and welcoming. Lovely. Let's find out more. The origins of the story, of course, remain a mystery with various interpretations ranging from folklore to my personal favorite, extraterrestrial encounters. Love aliens. Love that. Grew up watching signs. You tell me in the comments. Did this happen? Are these aliens? Were these just random children? This is all bullshit. Who knows? Number seven, Shroud of Turin. The origins of the Shroud of Turin, a piece of cloth that bears the image of a um, one Jesus Christ, a crucified man, shrouded in mystery, it seems. According to tradition, the shroud was used to wrap the body of, again, one Jesus Christ after his crucifixion, and many Christians believe this right here to be the burial cloth of Christ. I pointed like I actually have it here. I don't have it here. I wish I did. That would be great. We get a lot of likes, but no, it's over there. However, its authenticity is the subject of ongoing debate, of course, because... I mean, who really knows? The shroud first appeared in historical records in the 14th century, and it's been housed in Turin, Italy, since the late 16th century. Again, that's a pretty mighty piece of cloth right there. Next national treasure, Nicholas Cage has to grab that and put it in his pocket like a cowboy. Number six, John Cabot's fate. John Cabot, he was an Italian explorer who sailed under the English flag, and he's known for his voyages to North America in the late 15th century. His final voyage in 1497, this was intended to establish English trade and settlements in the New World. But Cabot, he set out with a small fleet of ships from Bristol, England, and he sailed along the eastern coast of North America. However, something happened. He encountered difficulties, I guess one could say, including rough weather and a mutiny among his crew, which is much worse than a storm, I would say. And his fate remains unknown to this day. That rhymed, Dr. Seuss, love it. Some historians believe that Cabot may have perished at sea, while others speculate that he may have made it back to England and then died there. So how did he go? Was he eaten? Who knows? Who really knows? Number Five, the plague. Yes, we just lived through one of these. That's in the, isn't that neat? Can't wait to tell my kids about that one. Plagues are everywhere throughout history. Some are short, some are impossibly incredibly long. The bubonic plague arrived to medieval England in 1348. Now the death toll here, it was devastating. I mean, we put up some crazy numbers in the last few years, don't get me wrong, but in the dark ages, the bubonic plague took out almost half of England's population. That's insane. They didn't even have Uber back then. You're like, how, how did that happen? Back then the plague was a bacterium now known as your pestis. Symptoms were jarring to say the least. There were lumps in the armpits and or um, you know groin area. Not fun. Black spots would appear all over your body. It was uncomfortable and it was noticeable definitely to say the least that you were plagued out. Almost all that were infected died within three days. More often than not without a fever. Just randomly. Boom. Done. The drop in the population resulted in a widespread of wealth. That's uh, I guess a bright side. Not really. Workers were demanding higher wages. Farmers were demanding lower rents and the poor got expendable income. Sounds a little familiar, dare I say. Number four, Greek fire. One's absolutely crazy. Greek fire was a weapon used in medieval times. It was particularly used by the Byzantine Empire and it was known for its ability to burn even when submerged in water. Yeah, almost like magic, some would say. Some scary hot magic. The composition of Greek fire was a closely guarded secret, but it was known to be a highly flammable liquid that could be projected from tubes onto enemy ships or soldiers. So yeah, they would just blast liquid lava at you and then they're like, yeah, 
War's done, just like that. Like in Game of Thrones, where it's just green fire, it was kind of like that. Greek fire was often used in naval battles and set enemy ships ablaze in four minutes or less, and its use was a significant factor in the success of the Byzantine navy. The exact ingredients and recipe for Greek fire, like I said, they have been lost to history, and its composition remains a subject of debate and speculation among historians. Let's hope we don't find this one. I don't know, let's find some pharaohs, mummies, tombs, treasures, that's great. Some guys like, oh, the recipe for liquid lava, that we can shoot at people. Awesome, let's do it. Number three, the Vinland map. The Vinland map, this one's fun to all the toptographers, hortographers, toptographers, map people. This one's for all the map fans out there. The Vinland map is a medieval map that depicts parts of North America, including a region known as Vinland. Not to be confused with Vineland, that's pretty good, I, that's a fun one. Vinland is believed to have been visited by the Norse explorer, Leif Erikson, around the year 1000. Now the map was first discovered in the 1950s and it's believed to date back to the 15th century, Buster Ryan. I'm like, huh? however, its authenticity has been the subject of ongoing debate among scholars and historians because, you know, it's like Atlantis. Some have argued that the map is a forgery, while others believe that it's a genuine medieval artifact, like the Shroud of Turin with, you know, Jesus' selfie. This is amazing. I have to say, I believe this was once a real place. Sure, why not? The amount of pharaohs and leaders, dictators, all these people throughout history lost in books that have been burnt. Of course, there are places and maps that have also been lost to history. Or maybe I've watched too many national treasure movies. Could be, could be the latter. It's probably that too. Number two, the dancing plague. All right, this one's fun. Hit that like for Step Up 2 fans. This one's gonna be real sick. July 15, 18, one of the most bizarre dance circle slash plague events, who knows really, in medieval history went down. It was the craziest dance circle all of history, I have to, have to admit. The dancing plague. Yeah, why can't this be the plague that comes back now? Why, it had to be the one that was gross, everyone's coughing on each other. Why could we all just be popping and locking in the streets in 2020? Would have been way better. The town of Strasbourg was calm, cool, and collective one summer, back in 1518, until out of nowhere, one woman began to dance, or convulse, uncontrollably in the streets. Others soon joined her, which is the weird part, and eventually over 400 people were all dancing the days away, or convulsing, one of the two. It's really tragic. See, this was not a good time. It's, you know, we call it the dancing plague, like, oh, they were all dancing in the street. No, it was a Nightmare. People are like seizing on the ground. Seizing? Seizing? People are seizing on the ground. It was tragic. A good amount lost their lives due to pure exhaustion alone. The authorities, they tried their best to help out the situation. They uh, they paid for musicians to perform for them while they convulsed, which is just the thing you need back then. They're like, oh my god, what's happening? Quick. They just played music. They're like, this makes it way better. This is so fun now. No, it was horrible. Everyone was sick. This was a disease. This happened a few times in Europe, believe it or not, between the 14th and 17th centuries, and we still don't know what exactly happened. All we know is that it was some sort of illness and that it was not like step up two. Apparently it was not sick, nor 3D, nothing like that. And finally, number one, no insults. This one here is great. This would change the game today. If we brought this one back, so good. I can't whistle, but It'd be like that. If you hurled insults at somebody back in medieval times, they were entitled to compensation and they could summon everyone else who's around at the time to be a witness. Yeah, if you spoke bad of someone during the Viking Age, even if the person wasn't there, it could ruin their reputation. And because of that fact, you now need to pay them for the possible damages you caused with your words, with your sick, nasty words. It doesn't even matter if the insult was true either. The reputation was how you gained employment back then, how you met friends, and it was really important. It was an important thing not to be messed with. Also, if you insulted one man, apparently you insulted his entire family as well. So it's like that Vin Diesel kind of fast and furious families everything vibe where with one person, they're all coming at you. It was rough. There were some words, however, where a man would be allowed to kill you if you said it. I don't even want to know which words that was. Sometimes you went a little too far spreading lies, so they had to make it a capital punishment. Now, thou shall not talk smack. Get out of here. At number 10, water carrier. These days, we have it so easy. We have the internet at our disposal to learn about pretty much anything. We have cars to get us from point A to point B, and all of our resources are close by. We get food from the grocery store and water from the taps in our houses. But back in the Middle Ages, things were a lot tougher for people, and they had to go through a lot just to get basic life necessities, like water, for example. Getting water to people wasn't as easy as you might have thought, and so that's why getting water became a whole profession. In a medieval city, you lucked out to 
depending on the area that you lived in. If you lived close to a river or stream, then you could get all the water you wanted and pretty easily too. But if you weren't so lucky to live near this resource, then you might have had to hire a water carrier to fetch it for you. People sought out strong young men to become water carriers for them, and as the name implies, they would get paid to go to the nearest source of water and bring it back for their employer. This profession became pretty popular in the late medieval period in London, and by this time, so many people were working as water carriers that they created their own fraternity. At number 9, Town Crier. I'm sure you've heard of the Town Crier at some point in your life, right? They're often incorporated into pop culture pieces that take place in the medieval times. When you think of the Town Crier, you might also think of the famous Hear Ye, Hear Ye that is associated with the speeches of the Town Criers. Back in the Middle Ages, the role of the Town Crier was a very important one as it was a crucial way for the local authorities to communicate with the residents of their community. The Town Crier would often make announcements of new laws, royal proclamations, the start of events, and even the punishments of criminals. They were basically the news anchors of the past. Also, as I mentioned, we normally associate the town crier with the phrase hear ye hear ye, but the phrase first started off as oye oye oye, which later evolved into the phrase that we are more familiar with. Before we carry on talking about these strange jobs from back in the days of old, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Scribe. These days, most people know how to read and write. It's part of our basic education, and is one of the first things that we are taught as kids in school. As you progress in society, basic literacy is taught more and more throughout the world, as some people in parts of the world might not have access to this privilege, but back in medieval times, most of the population was illiterate, which made the roles of scribes so crucial. Not everyone had access to the right education, but for those who did and could read and write, they often became scribes. The role of the scribe was as straightforward as the name predicts. Essentially, their job was to write. Scribes were hired to write all kinds of documents ranging from letters to business contracts. One of their hardest jobs though was to copy manuscripts, which was a job that may have taken a scribe several months to complete. Many men and women in monasteries held jobs as scribes, but for common folk in villages, being able to become a scribe was seen as highly valuable as well. At number 7, Reeve. These days we have elected officials in our communities who serve as a sort of voice of the people. Back in the Middle Ages, they sort of had someone similar to that and they were called Reeves. The Reeve was something of a local administrator, and their job was to oversee the day-to-day -day running of a manor, as well as to solve disputes between the peasants. The Reeve was a peasant too, but they were normally elected by their neighbors or chosen specifically by a lord, and served as a Reeve for a one-year period. This job eventually faded away as the feudal system began to decline, but fun fact, you can still find some Reeves in parts of Canada. At number 6, Peddler. This next job from the Middle Ages is one that we kind of still have these days, just a little more modern. We're talking about peddlers. You know how there are people who go door to door trying to sell you something? Like back in the day when Avon used to do house calls? Well, this was essentially what peddlers did. Their job was to travel from village to village to sell various goods. This was how a lot of people in more remote areas were able to buy certain items. The peddler's job was pretty important for the local economy because it was able to bring business to larger areas than just one local town. It seemed like a good enough job, but socially speaking, peddlers were always looked at with suspicion. Oftentimes, local people would accuse peddlers of being criminals. Now, they easily could have been criminals, but it's really a case-by-case -case situation. You can't judge someone for just trying to get their coin. At number five, Gong Farmer. Now, now, even though there were simple jobs like being a scribe and carrying water to people, there were also some messy and not so glamorous jobs as well. This next one I'm about to tell you about was definitely one of the worst jobs that you could have. See, there was a time before modern sewers and plumbing were a thing. This was a pretty icky time because rather than waste being disposed of in sewers, they were deposited into a privy or cesspit. Now these things had to be cleaned out periodically, and guess what? There were people who were hired to do just that. The gong farmer was someone who was hired to maintain the cesspits, and so they would be given a large ladle, and they would scoop out the waste and transport it away. Now I can only imagine how horrible that job would have been, and how horrendous the smell would have been too. It sounds like an absolute nightmare, so I'm glad it's not a thing anymore. At number 4, Galley Rower. 
Now as bad as it might have been to be a gong farmer in the middle ages, there was apparently a job that was much worse that people would do anything to get out of and that was the galley rower. This was considered to be one of the most grueling jobs from the middle ages and I can see why. These people would be tasked with working on a galley and rowing a ship along with a team of up to a thousand other people. Apparently people hated this job so much that they would try and avoid being picked to be a galley rower at all costs. Many people would join the pre priesthood in order to become exempt from becoming a galley rower. Usually this job would go to the poorest peasants and even slaves as it became more and more difficult to find people for the job. That was one occupation that everyone agreed was the worst. At number 3, cup bearer. Now this is a job that I wish was still around. Not because it's a great job or anything, but I feel like it could have been cool to have my own personal cup bearer so I could feel like a queen, you know? The job of the cup bearer was pretty self-explanatory. Their whole occupation was to serve the monarch their drinks. Now I know I said I would have wanted a cup bearer so I could feel like a bougie queen, but the cup bearer's job was a little more important than just serving drinks. See, there was always the fear that the reigning monarch could get poisoned because it was a very common act of treason back in the Middle Ages. The cup bearer was the only person tasked with serving drinks to the king or queen because they had to make sure that it wasn't poisoned, even if it meant tasting the drink themselves before serving it just to make sure that all was well in the cup. A lot of trust had to be put into this cup bearer so they could be quite influential in the courts if all went well. They were risking their lives and safety doing a pretty basic task, but it was for the good of the realm. At number 2, Alewife. Speaking of drinks though, let's talk about how the drinks got into the cups and who made them. In medieval England, women were mostly tasked with the practice of brewing ale and they were aptly named alewives as a result. Alewives were very important not only for business but also for the good of their families. Brewing was a quote, small scale, low investment, low profit, low skilled industry, but it brought success to a lot of married women as well as a substantial amount of independence since this would have essentially been their business and their own source of income. These women would always be hard at work brewing because they sold their ale quite quickly. Ale didn't have a very long shelf life and so they would make and sell their beverages quickly to keep up with demands and to compete effectively with others in the trade. Eventually though, the alewife was extinguished by the 15th century as brewing became more commercialized and people sought to take the independence of women away. And finally at number 1, alchemist. As you can probably imagine, science wasn't all that advanced back in the middle ages. There wasn't really much understanding of how the world worked. Back in these days, there were people who tried to practice science in a way that they knew how before many advancements in the field came out and these people were called alchemists. These alchemists believed that it was possible to change metals and chemicals. They tried to purify metals to change them into other things, and one of the most common experiments was trying to convert tin into gold or silver. For other alchemists though, their mission was to come up with new medicines to heal people and cure them of their ailments. Alchemists were quite popular until the 17th century as the ideas behind alchemy were replaced by the science of chemistry. I guess you could say that alchemy walked so that chemistry could run. So in at number 10 we have witch marking. I'm trying to avoid some things we've already covered in similar videos, so while we've discussed witches, let's talk about witch marks. So during the English and Scottish witch hunt days, there was a belief that witches always had a natural skin mark. This could be a mole or a scar or a pock mark or even a really bad zit. So when they came across a woman who they thought were a witch but she didn't have any of those markers, that was the end of it, right? She isn't a witch? Well, no. They gave her a skin mark instead. Specifically by using a pricking needle which the witch hunters would carry. These needles repeatedly pricked the flesh of the accused until it produced the result that wouldn't bleed but was insensitive to pain, which fulfilled the criteria of a witch's mark. It's a subtle punishment for something that they were yet to be accused accused of because by giving them the mark they could now accuse them. These witch hunt days were a whole mess. Number 9 is marking your territory. Not in a cool sexy I got a tattoo way, more in a scarlet wetter kind of way. As you'll learn in this video, a woman who cheated or even was single and just engaged in intercourse of her own free will could be classified as a sinful adulterer and cheater and be punished, usually a lot worse than a man. So when Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote the scarlet letter, he took inspiration from real life events. The letter, which for the 
character Hester Prynne was just a red A was usually the letters AD, which stands for adultery, as outlined by the Plymouth Colony Law in 1658. Multiple accounts across Europe verify that someone who was being marked was to be seen out in public without it, could be subject to public whipping and other public humiliations that ensured a person's social alienation. Like in the Scarlet Letter, when Puritan minister Arthur refuses to admit his sinful side of the act with Hester, he's branded with an A in his chest. In a man's case, while this was of course painful, it was allowed to be hidden. He also didn't have to face the societal consequences the way any woman would have. For number eight, we travel to discuss status degradation. While it still persists today, not everyone knows what it means. So essentially, you do something wrong, oopsies, you lose some of your basic human rights. You could steal something, have relations out of wedlock, cheat on your partner, miss some work. Every empire that has used this tactic has had a variety of ways that you could mess up and receive this punishment. Naturally, in times where a woman was property and couldn't buy things, own things, or do things, or breathe without having a man side eye her for it, this was a monumental punishment to receive. Under the Roman Empire Augustus, who reigned from 27 BCE to 14 CE, a woman guilty of adultery could lose several rights as a citizen and suffer a financial burden. Noble women in the Kingdom of Korea during the Chosan Dynasty faced a similar degradation of their societal status if they were found guilty of remarrying as a widow. This intentionally made it hard for Korean women to remarry as they would have nothing to offer a new husband, no inherited lands or funds, and a societal belief deemed her as used goods. Even the descendants of widows of the time who had remarried faced status degradation. They were barred from ever holding office. Adulteresses in the Chosan were stripped of many of their rights and privileges once they were demoted to low born statuses. As serious as these punishments may seem, some high status women who committed adultery in the Chosan dynasty faced an even graver punishment, which was death. So why take someone's status from them as a criminal punishment? Well, because aside from the fact as a woman you'd essentially be left jobless, homeless, and without any family, it's because of a cheater's fama, number seven. While fama is a Latin term for reputation and good name, every country had its own version of this fama. And if you cheated or were even just accused of cheating in 13th century France, which by the way happened a lot because husbands just want to get rid of their wives, the woman was always the center of the punishment, even if that was the man who had been cheating. This is because the status is all a woman ever had for a very long time, and the name of her family's reputation laid on her shoulders. Thus, all that pressure to be religious, virtuous, and most importantly, a submissive woman. The customary laws of Agen province list public humiliation for both the wife and her lover as the appropriate punishment for adultery. If the man could escape before or even after arrest, he could get off without any punishment and his partner had to face her punishment alone. The woman got no such reprieve, even if she was just the mistress he cheated on his own wife with. In fact, if she tried to escape arrest, it warranted a death sentence. Women whose fama suffered through public shaming walk of atonement were no longer deemed honorable members of society, and seeing as damning of individuals before law at the time was often based on their reputations, what others thought of them, and how they behaved in public, she'd be left, as I said, homeless, familyless, and dejected. For my Game of Thrones people, think Cersei. Number six is no protection. Get your mind out of the gutter. That's not what I'm talking about. I mean, there's no protection from capital punishment. While civil laws were easier to work around by just getting married alone, you can borrow money or property, you can buy things that you couldn't before and sign contracts, the criminal law didn't bend to a married woman, as she faced the same penalties as an unmarried one. Now, there are technically one exception, pregnancy, but only because it could potentially be a boy, which is insane. Additionally, all women were exempt from certain torts, such as the breaking wheel. But man, when a woman got capital punishment, it was the one and only form, and it was the most brutal and painful one, burning at the stake. By the way, they claim this was the only and the necessary option of execution for a woman, as it's a preservation of female modesty. Apparently, other forms of execution were unbecoming of a woman. Although there may be some truth to this wild justification, modern historians have rounded it down to just misogyny, as well as a deep-rooted suspicion and dislike of women as the root of this execution decision. Essentially, when given the opportunity to punish a woman, men went ham for it and wanted to see her suffer as much as possible. So women experienced the worst executions of the Dark Ages. Number five is why women want to stay in religious favor. In medieval Europe, a device was literally invented for women who defied their religious beliefs. Pyramid shaped and made of wood, the woman who dare to defy her god should fear this. See, they would bind the woman's hands and ankles and then sit one of her two 
the openings on the peak of the pyramid. She would then be incapable of shifting her weight anywhere else and was forced to put her weight down on the tip. It would slowly slide upwards and inwards and the longer she was pressed down on it, the more her body split apart. These women would be left for days on end sometimes on this device. The device's slow agonizing death can be compared only to the shame it inflicted as well. The woman was stripped nude and forced to suffer this torture in public for all to see. Number 4 is harems. To start, the word harem is derived from the Arabic word harim, and it often means sacred, forbidden, and sometimes sanctuary. This was an accurate name as only women's household members and some related male members were allowed to enter a harem, which was an honored women's space. The harem was the ultimate symbol of a sultan's power. His ownership of women, mostly slaves, was a sign of wealth, power, and sexual prowess. The seclusion from public gaze also inflated this power more so. But a royal harem could be a place of filth and stink where chaos and emotions ran high. This was the price of being property. Used by the emperors and his sons, you could either be favored or so hated that one day you vanish and rumors of your exile whirl amongst your peers. These ladies usually did not have the liberty to move out of the harem as they liked, but inside the harem they could move around as they pleased. There was no sisterhood in them either. Socializing amongst themselves was usually not friendly and jealousies were shown directly. Makes sense, as status and position of authority in the harem were determined by the place that they had in the emperor's favor, and to give the king his first male child was a great competition in this regard, resulted in unpleasantness through the royal harem. Everyone tried their best to please the emperor and turned her bad qualities like jealousy, aggression, or short-tempered attitude onto other women. Seeing as many of these women were stolen from outside the empire, let alone inside, frustration with language barrier and culture clash was also a huge source of contempt. Sometimes the women would lie to the sultan to have others disposed of, or they'd simply gang up on one another. Regardless, harems were places of drama, inequality, and a race to be favored as a ticket out of sexual servitude. Hidden sexuality is number three. There were plenty of mainstream laws in medieval and middle Europe against male homosexuality, and while it wasn't considered as serious, lesbianism still posed a threat to the ideals of a male-centric societal order. A law written in 1260 France stated that women caught engaging in homosexuality shall undergo mutilation on her first and second offense, and on her third, she must be burned. This is one of the only laws to specify consequences for lesbianism, but the 13th century and Christian perspective of sex radicalized further into modesty. Lesbianism was equated to sodomy at that time point and therefore carried a similar sentence, death. There is sufficient evidence of lesbians in middle ages, most of which come from the church. Turns out many nuns were sexually active lesbians and the church directly acknowledges their presence by having to pass laws, establishing penalties for nuns caught having sexual relations with each other. So not only were they having sexual relations with each other, but it was enough that the church had to do something about it. For example, during the 8th century, Pope Gregory III gave penances of 160 days for unnatural female acts. Still, no torture or death though, this is because as long as phallus or other phallus shaped objects weren't used or involved, the relationship wasn't considered real intercourse. Real intercourse involved procreation after all. So eventually, when Christianity upped the ante, however, any sexual act that caused pleasure, which now included lesbian in intercourse or plain old self stimulation, was now considered sin. So like most women of the Middle Ages, even bisexual and lesbian women had to settle down for a man at that point. Anyone who struggled with sexuality can imagine how dreadful it would be to live that way. Divorce was a nightmare, which is why it's number two in our countdown. Laws worldwide were unforgiving of divorces, literally always to the woman. In Chinese laws, a woman could only divorce her husband if he mistreated her family, not even her. He, on the other hand, could divorce her for anything. Some accepted grants for divorce were failure to bear a son, evidence of being unfaithful, lack of piety to the husband's parents, theft, suffering a virulent or infectious disease, jealousy, and talking too much. A pretty superficial list, but in Chinese society, divorce was a serious action with social repercussions for both parties, so consequently divorces were not as common as they may sound. She could not be divorced if she had no family to return to or if she had gone through the three year mourning period for her husband's dead parents. And speaking of family, during the Han Dynasty, unmarried women brought a special tax on their family and women with babies were given a three year exemption from the tax and their husbands a one year. So there was a huge push to get married. Meanwhile, in medieval England, their similarities are stark. 
They too had a small number of divorces despite an expansive list of reasons to do so, such as there was a discovered blood relation between the individuals, or impotence, or fear used to obtain consent, marriages entered into under false pretenses, things like that. In many of these cases, the lack of sufficient evidence made them difficult to prove and thus deterred people from taking their cases to court. And number one is the tradition of foot binding. It existed for around 10 centuries, and there are women alive today who still have feet that are the result of feet binding. Foot binding involves systematically breaking the feet and shaping them inwards. This tradition started in the Five Dynasties Ten States period of the 10th century, when beloved concubine of the emperor built a gilded lotus flower stage and performed a dance on bound hoof-shaped feet. Being a beloved concubine, the other concubines of the emperor attempted to imitate her feet to curry his favor. So foot binding began within the royal court and spread through China as the next fashion fad. It's done in a ritualistic ceremony accompanied by a variety of traditions to ward off any bad luck. They began by tucking the toes under the feet and using a long, tight ribbon wrapped up to the ankle to hold it all in place. Anytime the foot grew, they broke it inwards more, a process usually taking two to three years. The foot would remain bound for the rest of a woman's life. There is a whole list of issues this caused. Outside of extreme agony and being a handicap, it caused some women pain for the rest of their life. Their walk was changed, as was their posture, and the idealism of a slim body to lighten the pressure on one's feet was all the rage. The binding of feet actually caused the women to develop strong muscles in their hips, thighs, and buttocks, so much that the characteristics were considered physically attractive to Chinese men of the area, aka the girlies were thick. When colonization came to China, Western women boycotted foot binding, going as far as to catch women with bound feet and cut off their bindings. A humiliation because these women would never ever show their bare feet to anyone, let alone even husbands. And many of these women lost their husbands when the Western boycott worked. A lot of girls who had had their feet bound in order to become marriageable, suddenly found themselves abandoned by their husbands because foot binding was no longer fashionable at all. Starting us off is cutting edge courtship, quite literally in this case. It was traditional in some Nordic countries to have courtship customs involving knives and daggers. This is due to sacrificial nature in their original belief. The purpose of a dagger is prevalent for that after all, but it was also due to its functionality. In Finland, when a girl came of age, her father let it be known that she was available for marriage by providing her with an empty sheath. The girl would wear an empty sheath attached to her girdle skirt. If a suitor liked the girl, he would put a pukoko knife in that sheath, which the girl would keep if she was interested in him. If she wasn't, she could just toss that anywhere. The knives were often custom, so a man would be able to woo a woman with unique details and imagery on a blade, but could also offer an heirloom or traded blade. Seeing as women of the Nordic region didn't shy away from handwork such as farming, jewelry making, clay working, etching, clothiers, and even some positions like smelting, a blade was a thoughtful and convenient gift that also said, I love you a whole dagger's worth. Something so romantic about giving someone a gift they could quite literally kill you with. In the meantime, while the scans are giving blades, the English are being taught the no-no days and the no-no ways. In layman's terms, they were being told how to have intercourse and when. That just doesn't make for a fun title. You may be familiar with these laws and regulations. They've come up in some of our other medieval and middle age videos. This was a time period where the church had a lot to say in state affairs. Not to say that it doesn't now, but they were able to make determinations such as intercourse schedules around the religion. Real laws were in place that people could not have sex on Sundays, Thursdays, or Fridays due to religious reasons. Whenever a holiday had a fasting period, such as Lent, abstinence was expected then as well. If anyone was to deviate from the set rules by having intercourse, they were committing a grave sin. These laws were written in penentials, which were books that indicated what was allowed under the church rules and what was not. Oral, backdoor, premarital, and self-inflicted intercourse were banned in these books. Now thankfully, their wide range taboos included some good stigmas to have, such as interbreeding, so that minimized people keeping it in the family and messing up our future populations. But even with sexual laws, men could be knaves, which is just an old timely way of saying being a dog. Now, I'm not saying ladies couldn't have itchy feet and dog their way around too. We do it now and we've been doing it then, but it was a lot worse for ladies to be caught back then. So the general consensus is that it was rare and when it did happen, it was usually affairs outside of a marriage. In general, young medieval daters had to be cautious. While peasant marriages were a little more than saying, were married most of the time. Reputation, especially for a lady, was huge, as was virginal status. Men of higher status often sought out beautiful peasant girls for affairs. Sometimes they benefited the woman greatly and she'd become an heir to a status child, thus elevating her own. But for the most part, it was pure carnal enjoyment men were after in a time when women were told to do the opposite. And so it became a game of men trying to win a single woman into doing the act. She had everything on the line while he usually had nothing. Secret flings were frowned upon, to say the least, and 
were often seen as a sign of potential trouble, hence the English ballad that would warn of knaves preying on young fair maidens at country fairs. A young woman caught having affairs was a wild scandal that could even be punished for or put to death, so making the decision to bow to a lord's or even a common man's pressure could quite literally destroy a woman's whole life and being. Yet it's still a decision women made. Ah, hormones. Yet when it comes to marriage, it's always love versus politics. Medieval marriages tended to be negotiations, particularly around dowry, but it wasn't all about money. It was very important that a noble woman is a virgin at marriage purely out of pragmatic reasons. Marriage after all was an alliance union of two families that required healthy and admirable legitimate children to be truly locked in. It's for this reason as well as the violent men in society that the church law stated that the degree of pressure to encourage a marriage could not sway a constant man or woman, aka no forced consent. What was forced however was up to debate, so don't be too proud of them for having that law in place. A woman was able to call off her marriage up until it occurred for this reason, as was a man. Should this occur, dowry was either returned in full or only partially as a fee for the failed union. Alongside this was the courtly love direction romance and marriage began to take in the middle mid ages, during a Shakespearean and theatrical influence. Marriage started to become idealized, we'll circle back to how this affected people later, but lower classes consistently did marry for love, since there is little to be gained materially from marrying for them. For most part there was no official ceremony that the social level marriage was more like hey we're married now and living together. By 1400 AD there were actually many laws decreeing marriages needed to start becoming a public affair, and one may wonder how often people did marry in secret. Next up, watch lords try to impress ladies with a lance measuring contest. As mentioned, courtly love and chivalry are important facets of medieval society and culture, and seeing as tournaments and displays of masculinity were centerpieces of this culture, it's no surprise it made its way into courting. By 12th century England, tournaments were in full swing, usually consisting of jousting and melees, a big organized throwdown between knights that were not expected to be dangerous but occasionally resulted in serious injury or death. These tournaments were respectable places to meet potential suitors and singles flocked to these spots to watch heroic knights joust and parade themselves around while noble maidens looked on adoringly. Some contemporary conservative commentators as well as the church however, complained that the tournaments were places of frivolity, scandal and lust. Buzz kills. Don't worry, if sword fighting isn't your forte, then poetry or songwriting were also popular ways to express your love to a lady. And remember, when meeting a beloved, dress to impress, but not so much that you cause a scandal. Remember, sumptuary laws exist, it'd be pretty embarrassing to be arrested and sentenced on your first date with someone. It was advised that medieval women getting ready for a date should wear their tallest steeple hat and their best dress, and top it off with their finest linen wimple. This helped to elongate the neck, a long neck on a woman was considered beautiful. So was a bunch of other weird stuff that we'll get to in a second. Meanwhile, men should always remember on a day to wear their best gown and hose, which are pantyhose. But as said, don't dress too posh. The sumptuary laws of medieval England, such as the statute concerning diet and apparel of 1363, tried to ensure that citizens did not dress or consume above their social status. These rules included what kind of fur trims could be worn and by whom, colors, hats, patterns, shoes, and all the whole shebang. Check out our video Top 10 Unusual Medieval Laws You Never Knew Existed to learn learn more about sumptuary laws and laws of fashion. The rules of etiquette will most definitely help you avoid scandal when invited over to the family home of your potential lover, and they were genuinely as follows. 1. Keep your hands clean. Don't stroke the dog or the cat. Be sure to wipe your fingers on the tablecloth instead of licking them. 2. Bones are not to be gnawed, and don't pick your teeth with the sharp irons. 3. Don't eat with a fork. Forks were used to prepare food, but most medieval Europeans thought forks were an odd thing to eat with. 4. Don't eat with a knife either. Many people carry the knives on them on their belt to carve up the food before eating, but don't eat with it. 5. Okay, if it's a liquid, use a spoon. People tended to eat with their hands for everything else. 6. Don't sit too close to the salt cellar. Salt was expensive and associated with prestige, so it's a good dating tip at a big dinner to see who sat closest to the salt cellar. And 7. You can burp, but look up at the ceiling as you do so. And 8. Remember, you must not urinate at the host's premises unless you're staying overnight and it's before bed. Obviously, some of these things like wiping your hands on a table tablecloth, eating without a knife, or holding your pee until it's time to go are pretty unusual to us now. But back in the middle ages, if you wanted that shorty and not to ruin your reputation, well, you're burping at the ceiling bro, I hope she's worth it. Next up is how love makes you crazy. This is a fascinating wormhole to travel down, and I learned from several journal articles that lovers in the middle ages had a real tendency to go mad. I mean, we all know the examples, Elaine, the fair maid of Astrolot pining away, Romeo and Juliet taking their lives, and the raving madness of Ophelia, but these are just drama right? We tend to regard accounts of love madness in medieval literature as evidence that the 
they overestimated the strength of erotic passion. In classical and early medieval periods, sexual love was regarded as carnal appetite to be controlled, but with the rise of poetry sentiment and the theater came courtly love, which was seen as a highly spiritual desire. The idea of courtly love had more to do with the concept of loving rather than pleasure. This idealized kind of love was based on a secret union where two lovers could only love from far away. These sorts of unattainable relationships were increasingly romanticized, but in medieval society, the notion that erotic love could drive people mad may not be so unrealistic. We understand now that mental illnesses are sometimes provoked by the stress between the individual and their social environment. Think of the pressure a woman had to marry. Her whole life is purely based on existing for marriage and childbirth. The headspace created would be incredibly vulnerable to valuing all self-worth off of said marriage. If she had no suitors or faces rejection and begins to start aging out of normal marrying age, these could be detrimental to her mind. Mental illness existed in the past. This level of self-worth being carried by societal pressure that also will punish a woman for her sexuality or existence of it should it be perceived as sinful or unwomanly is unbelievably stressful. So yeah, women primarily would literally be driven insane by marriage and their value being tied up in it. But it's okay to be crazy as long as you're hot. So let's follow these medieval beauty tips. These are actually documented tips I rounded up. So let's run through the list. First, pluck your eyebrows and move your hairline back. A high forehead was considered attractive. One hair removal recipe was a vinegar mixture with ant eggs and ivy. Yum. Second, cancel all your Mediterranean trips. You need to whiten your face. Paleness was considered beautiful and to achieve this, some women would apply mixtures to their skin such as white lead powder mixed with sheep's fat. Weird. Third, while you're at it, hide those birthmarks and moles with homemade concealer. These blemishes were sometimes associated with witches in the Middle Ages. You may know this from our top 10 unspeakable things women went through in the Dark Ages video. One popular concoction was a face mask of bulls or hare's blood. Fourth, brunette is boring. Go blonde with organic hair dye. Flaxen hair for women was considered the most beautiful. Women who were not blonde could try a hair dye made from stale sheep's urine and saffron. If word of mouth wasn't enough to get these beauty tips to you, rest assured. Daniel of Beckles wrote a popular 13th century etiquette book. Regarding appearance, he said a man's hair should be neatly styled with a beard that was neither long nor shaggy and nails should be attractive and teeth should be kept clean. How do you keep your teeth clean? One recipe for teeth cleaning in the middle ages was to mix sage leaves with salt, roll into balls, bake them into a powder and then rub them on the teeth. Sage advice indeed. And if you do not want to be a scandalous unmarried spinster, you better listen to it. And last but not least, don't forget to bring the hemlock. Whether you're two dirty knaves trying to get down lawlessly or a married couple who didn't want kids, hemlock was your best friend. So yes, while the medieval church made it clear that sex outside and for some clerics inside of marriage was sinful, the literary and documentary evidence suggests that these medieval Brits were still finding ways to be as randy as rabbits without an illegitimacy scandal. It was Hemlock, a recommendation made by 13th century author Peter of Spain in his book Treasure of the Poor. Peter wrote men should rub boiled paste of Hemlock on their boys before intercourse. Seeing as Hemlock is poisonous, this was ballsy. Obviously they were open to whatever suggestions they could get. When Persian physician Abba BMZ Razi works was translated, Europeans gobbled up his suggestions, which was applying cedar oil onto the nether regions before intercourse for a man or after for the woman. He also said that if the woman jumps backwards after intercourse, the uh, stuff will fall out. Seeing intercourse before marriage itself was illegal and knavery was perceived the way it was, I'm sure I don't need to explain the scandal in this one. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have here a C. Okay, I can admit when I'm wrong, and in the last video last week, I messed up. I said the wrong word when talking about spoiled queens. You guys pointed it out, yeah? I read your comments, okay? And now we're here to redeem ourselves. I'm learning, you're already smart, let's get into it. In medieval times, it could be dangerous to disagree. Nowadays, many people like to keep an open mind. There's so many cultures, beliefs, people think different things, and that is totally okay. But it absolutely was not okay in the Dark Ages. Oh no. In these times, if you held any kind of belief that could go against the teaching of the Christian church, you were seen as a heretic. Many leaders, whether kings or crusaders or even missionaries and merchants, especially from the late 11th century, fought to have Christianity take over in the Mediterranean world. People belonging to other faiths, such as Jewish and Muslim people, suffered persecution and expulsion. In England, there were massacres, and in the late 12th century, Edward I banned all Jewish people from England. I mean, this quite literally set the stage for the Spanish Inquisition in 1478, which was aimed at establishing Spain as a united single 
single Christian faith. Wars in medieval Europe weren't just waged on people of different faiths, however, it was also aimed at some Christians who people believed to be heretics. This is all to say that heresy was a serious crime in these times, and thinking outside of what you were told to think at the time and what was accepted could have landed you a death sentence. Number nine, facial expressions. I can't grow facial hair. I'm not sure if you noticed that watching, but it's never happened. It's not gonna happen, quite frankly. I don't have to worry about trimming a beard early in the morning, anything like that, which is fine, to be honest with you. I can't, I'm not really complaining. Back in the medieval ages, I would have been set. People would have been pretty, I don't know, would have been more than ideal. The no hair look was the way to do it. The forehead was seen as the central point of your face, so it was common back in the medieval times for individuals to pluck all of their eyelashes and remove their eyebrows completely. So people would just be looking at you like, nothing going on, no facial expressions, just bald everything. Many would go as far as to pluck their hairline back even further so they have the round, oval, queen bald look. Imagine that. Imagine everyone's bald in Game of Thrones. Think it still get the rankings that it does? Probably not. Probably not. Macy Williams is just. In our number eight spot today, we have Animal Court. The history of animals being put on trial goes back pretty far, as it is believed it has roots in ancient Athens, but it was definitely a common practice as recently as the 18th century. Courts would go after things like rats, weevils, flies, locusts, and serpents for damaging crops, and when punished, they weren't just liable for damages, they could be banished and excommunicated. Like, imagine trying to banish a fly. This isn't where it ends, though. In civil criminal court, they'd have livestock being tried for violent against humans. Like, I'm sorry, your honor, my client could not tell the prosecution that she didn't want to be milked because she's a cow. Kicking was the only way. As an example of a real animal court case, let's take it back to 1457 France. Villagers in a town witnessed a sow and her six piglets attack and kill someone. Terrible story, sounds absolutely horrifying to have to witness. In this day and age, animal control would be called and all of those pigs would likely put down. But not in these times. When this happened, all the pigs were sent to court. Like real court. There was a judge, two prosecutors, eight witnesses, and a defense attorney for the accused animals. Witnesses provided testimony that proved that the sow had most definitely attacked the person and was definitely responsible for the crime. The piglets, however, well, for them, testimony was a bit murkier. There wasn't a witness who actually saw any of the piglets do any actual attacking. They just had blood on them, which isn't necessarily a sign of their guilt. It just means that they were there. This is why the court, while they did sentence the sow to death, the piglets were exonerated for their role in the crime. It's very strange and now would be a very expensive system, but in those times, it really did work for them. Number seven, inns and taverns. When we think of a medieval tavern or an inn, it's important to note the difference. Yes, there's drinking in both, and yes, both of them don't smell so great. But inns, their sole purpose was to house travelers comfortably, whereas a tavern, not so much housing. More rough housing, if anything, if you catch my drift. Say you're passing by one of these taverns, right, Saturday night, you feel like grabbing some questionable ale from some questionable establishment, well, you better come prepared. In the Middle Ages, you had to bring your own fork everywhere you went. Just a single, just one fork on your side, on your person, that's so gross. We didn't have a guy sitting in booth 11 doing roll-ups all night, looking at you, just wishing that he didn't work there, right? This was the Middle Ages, you didn't have a fork, no one had forks, if you had a fork, you were lucky, right? You were the rich kid on the block with an in-ground pool. That was you if you had a fork. Steak knives also were only reserved for carvers, so until the 17th century, you were just poking around your meal until you had a bite-sized amount, and then you ugh, would choke on it because it's all horrible. It's all chewy and horrible. In our number six spot today, we have the filth. If you lived in a city during this time in history, it would have been an absolutely filthy place to be. I mean, human and rats lived in harmony. Not harmony, re the plague. But things were so dirty, rats were everywhere. Want to go swimming in the nice stream nearby? Huh. Well, good luck, because not only is that body of water used for dumping sewage, but it's also for the village's water supply to both drink and bathe in. Disease was plentiful, obviously, and it spread exceptionally quickly. Spreading disease was even easier considering how all of the homes were packed full of people and no one really knew anything about hygiene and the benefits yet. 
health and otherwise. If you were to go out in the evening, especially at past curfew, it was also an insanely huge risk. Going out ran you the risk of getting killed or robbed with no police on the streets to help protect you at all. While city living provided a bit of safety in numbers situation compared to the countryside and also provided more opportunities to make money, it was still quite a risky place to live during the dark ages. Number five, teeth worms. Awesome, you have any cavities? Now you're gonna be looking this whole video. Dentists weren't common back in the dark ages, but they did have a barber. So I guess we're good for a few hundred years. This guy did it all. Cavities, toothaches, teeth, worms, gross, you name it, he'll pull it out violently. Barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, bloodletting, your classic three-in-one appointment right there, really, all in 10 minutes or less. Instead of brushing with tooth tunes, back then you would rub your teeth and gums with a rough linen. Yeah, just grab an old shirt. It's an old dirty shirt we're gonna brush up for school. Like you're playing a harmonica, only dirty shirt. A few recipes have been discovered since for pastes and powders to freshen their breath back then, you know. Otherwise, you were pretty screwed. You had nothing. We went from powdered charcoal to charcoal toothpaste all over again. What a weird loop we did. Mouthwashes were also made from herbs and spices steeped in wine or vinegar, so fresh breath guaranteed, no doubt about it. In our number four spot today, we have the stripes ban. We've all met someone before who seems to be concerned with what other people are wearing, and we jokingly refer to them as the fashion police. But back in the dark ages, you might come across some very real fashion police who are actually interested in fining you, should your finest tunic not be of the local dress code. Sometimes it wasn't even just a fine. Some serious fashion faux pas could lead to your imprisonment or even your death. Stripes were definitely a main culprit in these times, as striped clothing was seen as a garment of the devil. I'm not even exaggerating either. In the year 1310 in a French town, there was a local cobbler who was put to death because he had been caught in striped clothes. Yeah, we thought the tabloids were harsh, and I mean, they are, but the medieval fashion police were unforgiving. Not only were members of clergy not exempt from this rule, but neither were animals. Yeah, calling all zebras. Good luck out there, man. This is why zebras were called beasts of the devil. And yes, this is even though the people of Europe hadn't even seen them just heard tales of their striped nature. Number three, no rules football. In honor of the World Cup coming to a close, we have to take a look at football back in the late 12th century. Yeah, what did that look like? Or feel like, rather? Instead of corner kicks and throw-ins, you could do anything you wanted to retrieve the ball from the opposing team. Yeah, anything. Left hooks, some kicks, some jabs, throwing rocks, anything, you name it, it was violent. No diving in these games, I'll tell you that for free, you didn't have to. There was also no time limit. <clears throat> there was also no limit to how many players could be involved. So choose your team wisely, pick the biggest guy, pretty much. It's town versus town a lot of the time. There's a lot of emotions out there settled on the field. And in the middle of it somewhere, there would be a soccer ball rolling around. I would call this a sport. Now finally, come 1314, King Edward II banned the game. And yeah, more than fair, pause civilians and citizens are dying. He's like, yeah, maybe not. Maybe it's not wise. I don't know. In our number two spot today, we have fast medieval marriage. There are so many messed up medieval marriage practices. We could do an entire video on just that. And in fact, we have. Go check those out. But while you're here, let's talk just a bit about them. Marriage in the medieval times was quick and easy, but also difficult to prove. If you and your loved one wanted to get married, all you really needed to do was say, we're married, and then boom, it's done. Of course, this led to a whole pile of those spur of the moment type marriages, especially considering how sex before marriage was widely condemned in these times. You know, people are like, eh, it. We're married now, let's do it. Well, I'm pretty sure many people who were divorced would have preferred if their marriages were this easy. This led to people, of course, taking advantage of this difficult to prove thing. Most especially women would often fall victim to a man who might want to take you as his wife for the night. But then the following day after getting what he wants, he denied ever agreeing to the union of the two. If you're catching my drift. This is why many women tried to get at least one witness to union just in case. And finally, number one, Pointed shoes. 
This one's so fun. Whenever I see anything that's related to the medieval times, I always admire the attire, right? Especially the shoes. I hate buying shoes today so much. Now they're so specific. You got walking, running, trail shoes. They're always so expensive. Nobody does it like the medieval times anymore. Specifically, Krakows. Krakows were awesome. They were the style of shoe commonly worn in the 15th century Europe that looked really ridiculous. They had the long, huge long nose that went up really high. They're so silly looking, maybe that's why I love them. These long toed shoes first appeared in the 12th century, but the Krakow, the thing is, these things were twice as long as your foot, and that was considered fancy back then. These meant business, so you better watch those ankles, Beth, all right? We're going into some meetings fast. They were named after the city that they were made in. Krakows were worn by everybody at one point, but as cheeky as it sounds, the longer the shoe, the more valuable you were. There we go. So it turned into a joke eventually, right? These things got way too long and it looked ridiculous. You ever walk around in flippers beside the pool where you do that big silly walk? That's the walk that everybody was doing in town, right? It was out of hand. They would be stuffed with horse hair or moss. Yeah, which is just as comfortable as Dr. Scholl's. Imagine stepping around in moss all day, yuck. Also, sometimes a string would be needed to be tied from the tip of the shoe to your knee just to keep these damn things afloat. So everybody at one point in time, in the medieval times, looked like a Muppet tied to strings. How amazing is that? Do you own any Krakows? If so, how do we get our hands on a pair? I'm a size 11 and a half Krakow. Let's make it happen. Maybe if we all pitch in as a community. I don't know, we can all be wearing Krakows tomorrow. Number 10, pressure to perform. In the Middle Ages, either partner in a marriage was entitled to coitus with their partners under any circumstances. It was called the marriage rite. This went both ways, and unless you were passionately in love with your partner and straight, this could be a nightmare. It was so sacred, you could even get it on in a church, and the priest would be like, yep, go for it. Failure to perform in the bedroom or anywhere was grounds for divorce, which was a huge deal at the time. Now, the first problem here is a lack of consent, but the biggest problem for men who weren't inclined to sleep with their wives was impotency. There was no sympathy for men in these circumstances. If a wife accused her husband of this, then the couple would have to undergo a bedroom trial, where a crowd of wise elders, mainly grandmothers, aunts, and mothers, would watch the couple in their bedroom for three nights. If you were rich, this was even worse. These trials would be carried out in public in court. Yeah, that's right. The wife had to prove that the husband couldn't get it up in court. Now, he could call on women of the night to prove his prowess if he was so inclined, but if it was proven that he couldn't, then the couple would be divorced. But the bottom line, the main point of marriage was to have children, and if there weren't any, then this failure was placed heavily on the man. Number nine, beastly justice. I figured I would put a lighthearted one on this list. This actually made me laugh while I was researching it. Beastly justice was when animals had to go to court. They were also put on trial, like a full trial. It's wild to look back at a knight and the things they had to do for their kings and queens, but the fact that they also had to get up early and like attend these courts, royal courts, where a wild animal was taking the stand and it actually happened in history. This would happen after an animal runs through town. It would attack people, being confused and all, as most animals are, but the townsfolk would actually believe that the devil was involved in this animal's scheme. Like these animals worked for Big Red himself. In 1457, villagers in France had to deal with six pigs who ran wild and attacked locals. They did a lot of damage, so instead of just putting the animals down or setting them free, you know, away from your town, they took them to a real trial. There was a judge, a couple prosecutors, eight witnesses, a defense attorney for the pigs, which I gotta say, we should do a list just on that person alone. What a weird job. These pigs were hung from a gallows tree. A knight had to formally hang pigs after a trial was concluded. The 1400s were a wild time. Uh, Your Honor, due to my client being a pig, um... Number eight, a tanner. Even for a medieval peasant who never washed or clean themselves and literally lived in filth, this was a dirty job. Women were more commonly found in household chores or as milkmaids, barmaids, weavers, artisans, and tenant farmers. This job may have fallen mostly to men, and it was a rough one. I'll tell you. Men would rather go to war than do this job. You had to get skins from a butcher, along with the grime that covered it, which was mostly manure and blood. Then you had to trim the skins and get rid of all the hair. To do this, they had to let the hair follicles rot by sprinkling it with urine or soak it in a wood, ash, and lime solution. 
can you tell which one was cheaper? Then they'd scrape off the hair and any skin before washing it again in pigeon droppings or dog poo to remove the lime and make it softer and more flexible. You. Or the craftsmen might use fermented barley or rye with stale beer or urine, again, as an additive. This could take up to three months. Three months plus longer as there was more rinsing and stretching until it could be used. Leather was a crucial resource, so though dirty, it was a really necessary job, but oh my god. No thank you. Number seven, being a knight. Being a knight, obviously it sounds cool. They have the sword, they have the horse, the flowing hair. They're saving the damsel in distress, all that jazz that you picture in your head. It actually sucked being a knight, a lot. First of all, chain mail. You know how heavy chain mail is alone? It's like 55 pounds, and that was underneath all of your armor. No way I could climb up on a horse wearing armor or chain mail. My knees would buckle, no thank you. Being a knight is something that starts when you're seven years old as well. You would be given to a noble to learn for seven years, and then at age 14, you would become a squire. A knight's intern, not an ideal job to have when you're 14, but okay. But if you stick it out for just seven more years, then you become a knight. And then you can get your chest blown off jousting. Neat. All that time just to get rocked by another bigger dude on a bigger horse. No, just no for me. Number six, death by anything but mostly violence. Life in medieval times was considered basically brutal and short. If it wasn't the plague, it was a cold. If it wasn't disease, it was the weather. If it wasn't the weather, it was famine. If it wasn't famine, it was violence everywhere else. It was a damn miracle if you survived childhood. If you had to pick any other time in history to live, like you couldn't live in this one, Taylor asked me this earlier and I had a response, but it definitely wasn't this time. Literally block this time period from your mind. Between 1330 to 1479, men could expect to die nine years sooner than their female counterparts. The reason was violence against men by other men. But the biggest factor that made especially men's lives so short was the violence, as I mentioned. Think about it. It was men who were often called to war with only their farming tools, or if they were proper soldiers, they would have had more. But they were called off to do jobs that literally required them to kill or be killed. Homicide levels in medieval England were around 10 times higher than they are today. This isn't to say at all that women were excluded from this, they were mostly the victims of this violence, but there was a culture around men that expected them to take part in violence to the extreme. From drunken brawls, to duels, to playful sword fights gone wrong, torment, there was a lot going on. Male gangs were responsible for most of the mayhem as they were bolstered with the need to prove themselves. But also, if you were about to get mugged in an alleyway and somebody wanted to fight you, which was very likely because everyone was on edge, it was good to have backup. Number five, rat catcher. As the name hints towards, rat catchers are one of the worst jobs you can have in and around a castle. It's an important role, of course, like being a fool or a literal walking, talking toilet, which I'll get into later, but there needs to be a chasseur de rats. Chasseur de rats, I'm just gonna start calling myself that. Back in those times, rats and mice were the leading source of spreading disease. They didn't have city buses or you know, people walking around throwing bottles. And with these castles being big and dark, they were probably full of rats. Black rats were a common household problem, yuck. So in comes the well-respected rat catcher. These guys would sometimes try and use spells to get rid of rats. Wouldn't work really too well, but more often than not, that didn't work, so poison powders were the main trick of the trade. The most famous you probably heard of is the Pied Piper. He visited Germany, he arrived in the small town, and rumor has it this guy used a flute to drive all the rats just into the river. He just, hmm. He does a musical performance and then exterminates all of your pests. If anything, he should be getting a bonus, but rather the town insists they weren't even gonna pay him, so he used his flute to make everybody just go away and leave the town forever. What an OG. He's like, you don't wanna pay me? No sweat. <gasps> Number four, the Crusades. Just imagine this, thick, heavy metal armor reflecting the heat from the sun back against you as you chug along the desert. Despite being in the holy land, this certainly sounds like hell. As I mentioned earlier, men were expected to go to war when called, even if they had no training or skill and like maybe knew how to use a toothpick but had no idea what a sword was. For many, it was a death sentence and the first crusades were particularly brutal um, because you weren't only being called to war because of, you know, honor, but you were being called to war because it was a religious thing. Getting there was awful in the first place, you might not even make the voyage, then marches through the desert were long and hot with soldiers constantly at odds with starvation, dehydration, disease, infection, the elements, and then of course, a spontaneous attack from the enemy. So like, you're exhausted and all of a sudden you have to be like, huh, 
<laughs> fighting somebody to save your life. There are even stories of some of them boiling shoe leather to eat it because they had nothing else. And after what we know of tanning, Ugh. Many crusaders justified their suffering as a part of the spiritual journey, so if you did fall ill to disease, you were just kinda left by the side of the road to die alone. Number three, groom of the stool. Nowadays, assistants grab your coffee for you, maybe they answer some phone calls, keep the business running while you're off doing your other business stuff. Assistants are vital. The groom of the stool was quite vital when it came to the king. Created by King Henry VIII, the role was to assist the king's bowel movements. Yeah, you had just a box with you that you carried at all times, little opening lid, smelled horrible, and you would literally follow the king until he needed to use you. Yeah, porta potties weren't a thing, and there's no way you're going to catch a king shitting in the woods. In fact, you won't even catch a king wiping his own behind. That was also reserved for the groom of the stool. Lucky you. In this stool, you would have water, towels, a wash bowl, the whole setup. And you're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this role? What must you have done to deserve such a punishment? Well, this is the job you wanted, really. Only sons of noblemen could take on this role, and in doing so, they also gained access to every room, tons of nice clothes, any bedchamber furnishings, and of course, a high pay, yeah. I would say this is the craziest job on this list, but it's really not. Number two, the executioner. A man named Franz Schmidt meticulously chronicled his life as an executioner in detail. And well, as you can guess, it's not it's not a fun one, but there was a lot of humanity behind it too. He had to start practicing on pumpkins at first, then graduate to live animals, and then humans. Who would choose a role like this? Well, though legally the role wasn't hereditary, it pretty much was by expectation and blood. The job was passed from eldest son to eldest son with other sons being trained to fill vacancies. Daughters of executioners married sons of executioners, so the position would continue. As most people saw this as a pretty undesirable profession, it was difficult to keep anyone at their post, so the job fell to the men who inherited the axe, as it were. So. Not legally, but it was. This cycle of executioners created something called executioner dynasties across Europe. The existence of these dynasties meant that men were trapped in this cycle of employment and had few other opportunities to work. It also meant you had a very lonely life, as people who associated with death weren't people anyone liked to hang around. And number one, the gong farmer. The Gong Farmer, of course we had to end on this one as it's definitely the most crappy of the list. Medieval washrooms are just horrible. They're not really a thing. They didn't have the sanitation techniques that we have today. Stuff would often pile up within the castle walls and over time it would smell worse and worse. You can only imagine. The Rat Trapper would be around this area too, I'm assuming. So maybe they would see each other and fist bump and be like, hey, our jobs suck, nice, let's do it, get that bread. So these respected gong farmers, they would come in and take the bad stuff away from the castle. They were crap commuters, essentially. These cesspits were usually in the bottom of the castle, the lowest level, because you know how gravity and things work. These guys would go in and dig through years of yuck piles of it just moving all day long back and forth out of the castle. They too were paid well, really well obviously, but a lot of these gong farmers got sick. A good number of them just wouldn't come out of those pits. Pretty horrible, right? And on top of that, people didn't like talking to them. Their job wasn't cool like the guy who takes heads. Head and shoulders also didn't exist back then. They didn't smell the best. They were often just kind of, eh, and they crossed the street. It was sad, it was all bad. Hashtag all bad. Number 10, starting off strong with animal court. That's right. In the Middle Ages, apparently, it was a regular thing that animals would be put on trial. It was believed that animals who committed a crime were possessed by the devil. Of course they were, of course. And to let them go unpunished would give the devil the permission to take over human affairs. You don't want that, so they would be put on trial. Everything from hogs, beetles, rats, mice, cockerels, all have a history of being put on trial. In the 14th century, local people even prosecuted Spanish flies. Spanish flies were dangerous to livestock and would ruin vegetation, so needless to say, they weren't well liked. And they were appointed a lawyer, what kind of lawyer back then? No idea. And given great dignity in court, though the verdict was not favorable. They were condemned and banished from a plot of land. How exactly they enforced this? Who knows? 
An anywhere wedding. Number nine. Apparently, back in the Middle Ages, shotgun weddings were like the thing. It was the to do. One must simply exchange a sincere vow for another, or not even sincere. It could be like, you want to get married? Yeah, cool, awesome. And two people could be married. Considering the hot blood of the youth, this could happen anywhere, even after they had already done the deed. Therefore, keeping track of who was married to who got pretty confusing. So then the church finally decided to make marriage a holy sacrament, which must be observed by God, but not only God. The families had to make sure the ceremony was official all the way to the wedding night. Very often the bride would be carried to the marriage bed by the family who would then stay to view the consummation of the union. That's right, the tickly boo, the boo boo, the jiggy. That, yeah, yeah, that's right, your parents, your in-laws would wait until they saw you get jiggy with it. Number eight, the dancing plague. Not as much of a tradition, but an event that almost became one. When I first learned about the dancing plague, I was speechless and hopefully you will be too. Keep in mind the Middle Ages weren't colorless, but there were some pretty bleak times. Doctors debate whether this event was caused by bacteria in rye that can cause hallucinations like LSD. But no one can really be sure. It just kind of happened, and it's well documented. All people know is that in Strasbourg in July of 1518, a woman named Frau Trafia started dancing in the street, and by the end of the week, 40 people joined in, and by the end of the month, 400 people joined in. It was nuts. It was like a massive, never-ending rave. Initially, physicians thought folks were just stressed out, so they even brought in professional dancers and musicians to like encourage the joyousness, but then people started dying from heart attacks and fatigue. So by that point, they were like, oh, we better cut this off. And so they whisked everyone off to uh, the mountaintop to pray. And apparently that prayed the dancing away. Number seven, men's fashion. I may be making a big statement here, but considering men's fashion has been variations of the tux for over two centuries now, kind of, eh, that's a stretch. This may be one of, if not the most colorful periods of men's fashion. Men got pretty risky when with their attire, like you're kind of impressed. Anglo-Saxon men wore tunics, trousers, leggings, and strappy leather shoes tied together with belts and girdles. Doesn't sound too crazy yet, but wait. Cod pieces were in, and tunics got shorter so they could see their front manhood. Also, very long shoes were a big thing. Uh, the longer the shoes, the richer you appeared, and the more pronounced the cod piece. Well, I think you. I think you get the picture. Men who wore pointier shoes had a higher social position. Some shoes were so long that they had to be reinforced with whalebone. They also adorned wide brim hats, felt caps, and hoods to protect their eyes during extreme weather. Number six, sexy and hairless. Women, on the other hand, had some even stranger qualifiers for beauty. Uh, while today having a thick and bold soap brow and a full head of hair is the ideal, it was the exact opposite for women in the Middle Ages. We have literally almost tried everything and I fear what happens next like women's fashion we just we've done a lot of stuff anyways in the Middle Ages a woman's forehead was considered the sexiest part of their face why no idea maybe because her breath was so bad it was better to kiss her forehead who knows but either way it was a big deal so what women used to do to draw attention to it was pluck their eyebrows hairline and ashes away to make sure it highlighted that part of their face. So at very often they would just have no eyelashes, no eyebrows, and like their hair would be like this far back. Number five, Feast of Fools. The Feast of Fools was a very popular festival in the Middle Ages where everything turned topsy-turvy. On January 1st, specifically in France, they would elect a mock bishop or pope and low and high officials would change places. Kind of like an adaptation of the pagan celebration of Saturnalia, which we talked about in another video. Find it and post it below. People would wear hideous masks to conceal themselves from the festivities so they could behave fully in the activities. There would be parades throughout the city featuring drinking, singing, men would dress as women and vice versa, along with the general mischief. Even priests and clergy would be seen wearing masks during office hours and dance as women, panders, or minstrels. It was officially banned in the 15th century because it got too ridiculous and, you know, the piety of the people were like, this is a sin. But despite the ban, it still continued into the 16th century. It seems like a pretty hard party to imagine, especially considering how pious they were back then. Priests dancing in women's clothes? Crazy. I mean, technically they're already wearing 
kind of dresses. They're long tunics. Number four, bloodletting. Along with traditions, there were certain medical practices that medieval physicians swore by. The most popular being bloodletting. Got a headache? Bloodletting. Have a flesh wound? Bloodletting. The plague? Hmm. Bloodletting. Emotions? Uh, maybe a little bit of bloodletting. It is exactly as it sounds. They would either make cuts to let the blood drip, or more usually, place leeches on the skin. The rationale behind bloodletting, though, is really important. It was related to the belief in the four basic humors blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. This translated to the four basic elements earth, air, fire, and water. Being ill meant something was off with the humors. And therefore, relieving an excess of humor was necessary. Therefore, if there was an excess of blood, it would be removed by bloodletting. If it was bile, they would purge it. Uh, blood was declared the dominant humor by Galen of Pergamum way back in 200 AD. So bloodletting became the most popular. This tradition even lasted beyond the Middle Ages into the 18th century. In the 1800s, the French went through 40 million leeches a year, uh, and also things started to get weird when George Washington was bloodlet when he had got fell sick with a cold. He died that way. It was a lot. Number three, here lies the heart. As you can expect, death was everywhere in the Middle Ages. I probably, I wouldn't have made it past the age of four. I had tonsillitis too many times. That's probably true for most of us. Making it past child rearing years for women was outstanding. For men, you'd be lucky if you made it past 30. Tough times. So it only makes sense we talk about some of their unusual funeral rites. There were many superstitions around burials, fear of disease, and even vampirism determined what would happen to the body. Eastern Europeans would stake bodies through the heart in order to keep them from returning. Especially if they had taken their own life, they would have to be beheaded. When a village was cursed by plague, drought, flooding, or something other, they would dig up the bodies to investigate, sometimes burning them because they thought, ooh, wow, what's happening? Their nails are retracting, they must be a vampire. During plague time, the normal burial methods were abandoned and they had to resort to mass graves. But on the battlefield, there was actually a very sweet tradition. If a loved one died on the field and the body could not be transported back, the heart would be removed instead. It would either be kept in a box of ivory with spices or buried somewhere. Number two, the mystery plays. If you weren't busy trying to avoid the Black Dead, then you might have attended something called a mystery play. Mystery plays were a sequence of performances referred to at times as the cycle plays. During the 15th and 16th century, before playhouses were even a thing, these plays were performed annually in the biggest towns in Britain. They were called mystery plays because they primarily addressed the miraculous mysteries of God himself. Throughout the whole course of the day, the whole arc of the universe from Garden of Eden all the way to Judgment Day was performed. They were organized and funded by acting guilds, which was another reason as to why they were called mystery plays. The troops themselves were called mysteries. The troops were often made up of craftsmen who would use the show to show off their wares. The performers were ordinary people with a flair for the dramatic, but they had to be damn good, otherwise they would get vegetables thrown at them. People looked forward to these performances all year round, so it was standing O or nothing. And last but not least, soccer. Like most sports, soccer actually has a pretty violent origin, kind of like lacrosse, though it was still considered a game. Soccer, aka the more accurate title, I have to say football, because football had far less rules. It could have an infinite number of players and could take part across an entire village. The goals were sometimes set miles apart and the game would often be used to settle disputes. As a result, they would they got they got violent. They got really really violent. You could you could do absolutely anything in order to get the ball, save actually taking someone's life. It also wasn't strictly football. You could use any part of your body to to get there. Wrestling, punching, kicking, scratching, tripping, you name it. If it got you a goal, fair game. But it is all fun and games until someone's eye gets poked out. In 1314, King Edward II decided it was time to put a damper on the game that was got too much injury and property damage. He forbade the games and condemned any who disobeyed to imprisonment, but you can imagine that people didn't play by those rules either, because uh, soccer still exists today somehow. 